Welcome back to the Noob Spirit Podcast, or welcome if it's your first time. Uh, my name is Isaac or Shrek, and this is the show where we interview spearfishing experts, authorities, and characters, dig out some of their awesome stories and some of the things I've learned al- along the way. Today, we're chatting with a pioneer. Uh, Gia Ta, he's a Florida legend. He's been spearing since 1965. Uh, he's been hugely influential in uh, spearfishing. And I, this is one of the things I really love about the show. It's getting to go around the world and see how different people do it, take some of the cool stuff, see if we can apply it in our own part of the world, whether you're diving some of the freshwater lakes in the north of the USA or whether you're diving Ireland or you're diving New Zealand or Australia, you know, in the Coral Sea, whatever it is, there's these amazing crossovers and learnings and tips and cool stuff that you can learn. And um, Jeepers, more than 130 episodes like this, so if this is your first episode, then welcome along. But um, G.R. Ta, he runs redtidespearfishing.com, makes some really cool gear. He's um, he's also been part of sort of pioneering and innovating a lot of gear as well. Uh, tuna clip float line um, and clip technique for landing big fish. He's come up with um, like ideas for semi-enclosed track hybrid spear guns. He's a crazy dude too. Like he just frosts on spearing and uh, he's been around a while and he just still still frosts on spearing. It was an absolute pleasure to chat with him. And uh, so we'll hook into that in just one second. I wanted to tell you a little bit more about noobspearer.com. There's a few things that have happened over on the old uh, over on the home of the Noob Spirit podcast, noobspirit.com. If you head over there, it's, there's way more stuff than just the podcast. There's, so every episode, there's a show notes page. If you go there, there'll be pictures of the guests. There'll be links to all of the things we chat about. There'll be sponsor deals and discount coupon codes for different spearfishing gear. So I'd encourage you to go check that out. There's also the new Ultimate Guide series. So like if you are wanting to learn about freediving and increasing your breath hold, there's an Ultimate Guide to Freediving for Spearfishing. And there'll be all of the episodes that we've done that have got really cool sections in there about improving your freediving. There'll be courses, there'll be videos, there's blog posts, everything. If you want to improve your freediving for spearfishing, check that ultimate guide out. But there's ultimate guides for every facet of, of, of spearing. Check it out at noobspear.com. There's also a real cool new section called the Nuba Stories. And if you go into the menu, you'll see a section, if you scroll down, where you can leave a voice clip or a story. You can leave a question. You can leave a, a scary story, what you learned from it. Um, but it'd be cool to hear from you guys and start putting that audio into the into every podcast and um and just sort of getting more of the community vibe going. And uh, if talking about community, if you if you do listen to the show all the time, I'd encourage you to join the Noob Spirit community over on Facebook. It's a, it's a lively group. We have some really good discussions, and uh, people are respectful and cool over there, and it doesn't really matter what stage of your spearfishing you're at. There's always challenges and struggles, so head over to Noob Spirit community on Facebook and join there as well. But also at noobspirit.com, there's merch, there's shirts, hats, hoodies, stickers, there's custom design penetrator fins, there's all sorts of stuff up there. There's the Floater email newsletter which comes out monthly. So head over to noobspirit.com and subscribe. But um, hey, let's hook in. We've got today GR Tar, the Red Tide Savage. This special episode of the Noob Spiro podcast is brought to you by spearfishing.com.au. Longtime partners of the Noob Spiro podcast, spearfishing.com.au have a listener deal. Use the code NoobSpiro to save $20 on every purchase over $200. Thanks for supporting the Noob Spiro podcast and shopping with spearfishing.com.au. Well, g'day Noob Spiro community. Uh, today we're in for a little bit of a treat. We've got GR Tar. He's uh, been in the sport for a little while. Just, um, I think you, you've been sparing like one or two years, GR, is that right? Yeah, I started in 1965, <laughs> so that would be um, about, about 60 years ago. Just a, cu- just a couple <laughs> of years, man. Um, you've done some cool stuff in the sport, and um, like, like I told you before the show, like I listened to your episode in Roman Castro's The Spear Podcast, and um I really enjoyed hearing a bit of your story, so I'm hoping that today's interview serves as maybe a little bit of a part two if people want to go and um, listen to that earlier one that you did on there, but that was cool. Yeah, I've got some great stories, like good stuff to share with everybody, and um, you know, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, awesome, man. Um, so you, you, you own and run Red Tide Spearfishing. Tell us a little bit about that. I, um, I'm curious. I, I see your gear around. I've never used any of it, but I'd like to know a little bit more about it. Yeah, I, I started Red Tide Spearfishing about 10 years ago. And, um, 
it was, you know, my whole life I've always, you know, built spear guns and made spear guns better and, you know, helped design stuff for friends and I've always just been a kind of a tinkerer, you know, and I guess that comes from, you know, before that I was in a motorcycle racing and I did a lot of tinkering and, you know, that sort of thing. So, you know, I had the mind for it, but, um, you know, in spear fishing years ago, you know, guns weren't very good and the gear wasn't very good. So, you know, as, as time goes on, you look for things that need improving and things you can, you know, make better. Um, I got into making shafts, you know, a long time ago. And that, that was like the beginning of red tide spear fishing. And you know, I, I would design them. And I had this, this engineer um, guy that had a, a plant that he could make them in. And, you know, we would build these shafts and started selling them. And, you know, now I'm like the OEM shaft provider for like a lot of companies. And um, that kind of rolled into the, the other stuff that I do, which is, you know, everything I sell, I mean, I'm not going to try, I'm not, I'm not here to sell any gear, but, you know, I, I, I just, um, you know, I look for things that are better, you know, than, than what's currently out there. And, and if I can't make something better, I don't even go into it. I don't even care. You know, it's just, I'm not, I'm not just trying to sell gear. You know, I'm trying to make gear better and sell better gear. No, I read a story about you too. It says like, um, you, you know, your whole house looks like a dive shop and you're, you, you've been like quite obsessed with, um, different aspects of spearfishing for years. And I read that you built your first spear gun when you were 13 from scratch. I'd imagine the, the YouTube tutorials, tutorials in 1965 weren't very good. Yeah. We didn't have YouTube back then. Back then it was, um, you'd look at something and literally I would, I would take a piece of cardboard and get a, get a Sharpie marker and just like draw out what I wanted to look like. And then I, I, I rode my bicycle to the wood shop. It was a, you know, a couple of miles away and uh, went in and saw the guy and I'm just this kid and I go, Hey, can you help me make this? And so he, you know, he showed me how to set it up and what to do and everything. And he let me use the saws and, you know, I, I cut them and made them. And Fire, yeah. the, the, first, the first couple were really crappy. Um, I'd imagine, I'd I started, imagine so. Yeah. So I started making better ones and getting better at it. And, and then, you know, I kind of found the gun that I liked and I just used that one for years and I never, I didn't know about that. There was a whole world of people out there spearfishing. I didn't know about all these different brands and things and, you know, whatever. They didn't have it back then. There was no magazine. You'd read a book every once in a while that had something in it, but it was a, it was a new frontier, you know? And uh, when I came to Australia years ago to do a tournament, um, I ran into some old time guys there and I saw some of the old gear that, that was used over there. And, you know, it was, it brought me right back to like square one, you know, <laughs> it was, it was pretty cool. Did, do you, did, have you thought much about sort of how the evolution of spearfishing paralleled between continents and different countries and stuff? Because it seems like there's a lot of commonalities, but there's also some sort of significant differences between the way countries sort of a, approach and think about gear and stuff. Yeah, I, I would definitely say that. That's one thing I've learned in my travels is that, you know, there's, <clears throat> there's, there's like many different trains of thought and, and the gear and you know what's good and, and it all drives from the region that they're in and what kind of fish they're shooting and what kind of orders they're shooting in you know I, I grew up shooting in tampa bay which is you know 10 foot or less visibility um you know shooting you know small fish but um we'd also get big fish like cobia um you know we'd shoot stingrays and stuff like that when i was a kid and you know we shoot everything but um you know then we kind of got out into the gulf and the Gulf had a little bit clearer water and we'd shoot groupers and snappers and, you know, hogfish and, you know, different types of fish. So, you know, your, your guns kind of had to change a little bit for that. So, um, so like uh, when you first built your, you, you concepted your first gun, I mean, what, what did you build and, and how did you start thinking about spear guns and building spear guns within the different diving contexts that you, that you've sort of found yourself in? You know, I, I'd seen a couple guns. I had a, a, a neighbor that had a spear gun. So I kind of used that as like the, the baseline. Um, you know, how to make, how to make the, the, what we call a firing pin, which is what the, the shaft sat on. And I made, I made the, the trigger out of my skateboard. <laughs> I took my skateboard and I cut it out with a hacksaw and I made a trigger out of that. And, uh, you know, it was kind of crazy, but, but I still have the gun. And it's funny, like about once a year, I'll take that gun and a couple of my older guns and we'll put them all together and some, some friends and I and we'll go out in the boat. And we'll use those guns for the day. Wow. And it's so funny. Yeah, we laugh and cut up and it's, it's a blast. You know, they go, how in the world did you ever shoot anything with these guns? I said, I said fish were stupider back then. I'd never seen a diver. <laughs> when you, you really only have to have something, you know, like a foot off the end of your, of your gun to, to shoot it. I, I, can, I can relate. I think my first spear gun was like that. But, I mean, that was only 10 years ago. But I made the mistake of, you know, buying cheap because I wanted to save a hundred and something dollars. And, um, and I saved the money, but I... 
I, I wounded lots of fish and um, this, like you know it's great that we've evolved in the equipment I think I, I like how um, effective it is these days and we don't seem to wound as many fish but there's something nostalgic about you know some of the older gear and some of it was super effective as well no doubt well you know you, you take like the, the Europeans I mean they're over there they use six millimeter six and a half millimeter shafts you know, if, if you were, if you use those in Australia, you, you'd be done in about 30 seconds. Yeah. yeah. You know? <laughs> a pretzel, you know, a pretzel, thing, a pretzel, yeah. you know, spaghetti shafts, yeah. we call them, you know? Yeah. And yeah. You know, so we had to make guns that had bigger shafts and, you know, they could, they could shoot bigger fish. So that, that, that first gun you built, I mean, what, what, what had it, was it a friction, friction based mechanism? How did it um, hold the, the shaft? Did you have a notch on yeah. the back end of your was shaft? Pure. Was it all the same? No, not even close. Oh. Um, what I had was, I had a pin that stuck up out of the top of the gun and then I drilled a hole through the top of the shaft and the shaft sat down on top of this pin. Oh, wow. And then the trigger was like a cam. So when you pulled it, it lifted up and pushed the shaft off that pin. Oh, wow. And I'll send you a picture of it. It's, it's pretty cool. That sounds really and, uh, cool. Yeah. And so, I mean, we, we experimented, we actually put groove in the top of the, a groove in the top of the uh, trigger, you know, so it would, the shaft would slot off easier. And, you know, it's so funny, years and years later, you know, you hear about the Rob Allen rail gun, you know, oh, it's got an integrated rail. I had an integrated rail in 1972, you know, <laughs> 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 and it's pretty funny, you know, to think about it that way. But, and you've been thinking about um, gear for a long time. I mean, uh, one of the things that's credited to you is the, the semi-enclosed track hybrid rail gun. Is that, is that sort of, um, tell us a little bit about that and how that sort of process that's developed. A good that's a good story. Yeah. So, so that story kind of evolved. Um, so years and years later, after building my first gun, I, I was probably in my mid thirties and I, I had been fishing in Costa Rica and I'd seen these big tunas there and I wanted to learn about that. And I, I read Terry Moss's book, um, about, you know, spear fishing and they have pictures of guns in there, just pictures. This is before the internet again. Yeah. You know? And, um, the, uh, you know, these big giant fish, they were shooting with these guns. And I said, well, I can make one of those guns. And so I, I went back to the same wood shop, the guy like years later, and this guy had to be like 80 now. <laughs> you know, and I said, Hey, I, I want to make one of these. And he goes, you're crazy. And I go, yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to go shoot a tuna, you know? And he goes, okay, well let's start. And so we, had a, we laminated, did all this stuff, whatever. Well, I, I needed, I needed a trigger mechanism and I had a Wong gun. I had one of his, um, hybrid gun, just a regular one with an open track, titanium barrel, just a, you know, basic gun. And it was a good, you know, I liked it and I, and I liked the trigger on it. So I said, so I called Daryl on the phone. I said, Hey, Daryl, um, I, I want to get one of your triggers. And he goes, okay, what are you doing with it? And I said, I'm going to make a tuna gun. He goes, you are, that sounds cool. You know? So I got a trigger and I actually got a handle from him as well. So I made my first, you know, tuna gun with his trigger in his handle. So I kind of got to know Daryl a little bit just from that phone conversation. And, um, so then moving forward another year, um, I went to a trip over in Africa and had some buddies of mine and we were on the back of this Bertram boat and we're coming in from offshore and we had all of our guns lined up on the transom and we're drinking a beer. And I had my, my enclosed track tuna gun sitting there next to my hybrid gun, open track, you know, gun ah. next to all the other guns. And I'm looking at them. I go, you know, it'd be kind of cool if you put an enclosed track on the hybrid gun. So I got back from that trip and I immediately called Daryl on the phone and said, Daryl, can you make a, you know, a, a, a gun with an enclosed track in the back and a, you know, the hybrid thing in the front. And he goes, he goes, you know, I thought about that once. And I go, well, let's do it. Let's make the first one. So he made one, he sent it to me and the thing shot great. It was fantastic. And all my buddies here wanted to get one. So they called Daryl on the phone and said, I want the same gun GR has got. I want that GR gun. <laughs> so that, that's when Daryl sort of called him the, the GR gun. Nice. So the GR gun, if you go on his website, that's like his, his thing. You want it, so you're, it's pretty cool. You're one of the few dudes with a spear gun named after him. That's pretty cool. I know. It's pretty funny. Huh? <laughs> and a cool spear gun <laughs> too. Like um, I've seen the pictures of the Daryl Wong guns. We, there's not many of them getting around Australia. I'm, I'd imagine there's a few, but I, I'm not aware of it. But um, I haven't seen one in Australia yeah, or New Zealand wow. actually. You know, Australia is dominated by, by Rob Allen. He's a great job over there. And, you know, he, you know, Rob builds a great gun. It's just a great straightforward shooter. And, and, you know, the parts aren't expensive and they're bulletproof. And, you know, they, they, they got in Australia and all you guys over there just took off of those things. And both, both coasts, the whole continent's covered with, you know, Rob Allen guns. 
And I did a competition over there. They, they all looked at me like I had three heads and I showed up with a, with a wand gun. You know, like, what the heck is that thing? Yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah, pipe guns are huge here. It's a, it's a good point you make. I mean, I, I, one, one of the reasons I really like Roll Balance is, I mean, those guys just continue to innovate. And I guess it's the same with you. But there's a lot of, like, super clever um, businesses in spearfishing, just dudes that continue to iterate. I mean, it's such a piecemeal sport, you know. Like, um, it's not like we have a huge audience or, of of rabbit consumers that spend millions of dollars. It's still an extremely niche sport. So I think every single manufacturer, if they if they keep going with what they're doing, they're, they're always innovating. And but um, yeah, I, I think you know you guys over there are the closest thing to it, like America divers, you know, that I've seen. Um, you know, over here in the U.S., you know, I, I think um, our divers kind of have a similar mindset to a lot of stuff, you know, to the Aussie divers and, uh, gears pretty similar. Um, you know, Rob Allen has a good footprint over here as well, but you know, one thing in America though, is the big wood guns, you know, they, they like big wood over here and that's their thing. It's totally different. You know, it's like, um, the, the big wood guns have always been on the scene that rife, you know, is a big wood gun. Um, and you know, there's a company over here called Koa now and they're, they're building big wood guns. And, and, you know, I, I'm talking about production guns, not, not just, you know, custom guns and, you know, they've, they've done really well because they, they, uh, the Americans over here, they, they like that that style of gun. Mm. Um I do too. You know, it's. I, I recently, I recently got out with a big timber gun. I, I tested three of my pipe guns. I had a, a double roller. I had a, um, I had a one three that with a breakaway set up for going over and shooting a blue water fish, and and my normal go to one oh five um, Salva Mar Hero, and I shot all three of those guns, and they were all pretty pretty decent. And then I used a, a big a Ballon um, timber gun, and I hadn't shot a timber gun for a while. This thing sh- shot like pinpoint at at five five meters from the end of the spear straight through this target the first time i pulled the trigger there's something about not having recoil and just such a solid shooting platform i think it forgives a multitude of sins with poor marksmen like me <laughs> <laughs> yeah i tell you victor's done a great job with you know with that that was a, that, those abelian guns were pretty you know cutting edge you know and came out and, and you know he he was on he was doing i didn't know who he was and, but we were both kind of doing the same things in different continents. And that was, you know, finding balance, you know, and balance is the key, what I found in, in guns. And, you know, um, a friend of mine in, in Polynesia, Mark, um, um, he came up with the idea. In fact, there's a guy, actually the guy, the idea came out of Australia, a guy named Tony, Tony, somebody. Tony Hugh. Makes it, you know, Hugh, yeah. He makes that 32 millimeter barrel gun. Mm, mm. You know, the edge, okay. edge spear and, guns, I think. Yeah. Edge spear guns, yeah. And so my friend, um, Mark, he came up, Mark Alexander, he came up with a, a pipe gun that was the same, same, you know, type thing, but made out of carbon fiber Yeah, right. and a super light, super lightweight. Um, and I've, I'm using that now pretty much a lot. Yeah, sick. And it, the pipe gun is balanced. I mean, you, you hold this thing in the water and it'll float on the surface with the reel and the shaft in it. You know, I mean, it's pretty amazing that you can get a pipe gun with that kind of balance because most of them are nose heavy and not, you know, not as, not as easy to swim with, um, is this, this thing's like swimming around with a feather, you know, it's, it's amazing. When you, and when you shoot it, it's just, you know, spot on, really accurate, really comfortable to swim with. It's, I really like it a lot, but it's, it's a limited production gun. I mean, you tell somebody, you know, they're going to buy a pipe gun for 600 bucks. They, they look at you like you're crazy, mm, you know, mm, mm, mm. all my friends use them. They all think this is the greatest gun I've ever used, but you never be able to sell that to the, to the, to the universe. Oh, so, so the, the universe still <laughs> less, less expensive games. Price sensitivity is such an, a, a, a funny thing with 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 spear. I mean, we're getting really pedantic here in spear guns, but price sensitivity is such a huge thing with spear guns. It's like we're quite happy to spend this this sort of within this band of money, and then like it's only really the super obsessed or or really detail oriented that'll go on and spend more money. And a lot of spearos think it's the law of diminishing returns, but you know, like as in the more you spend, you're not actually going to get a dramatic increase in performance, you know, but I, I I think that, I, I think that the, the, the minimum sort of amount that people want to spend on spear guns is, is too low. Um, and you just end up with these mass produced things. And a lot of them, like they're not, they're not safe to use. They're not accurate. And they've just been made out of cheap shit. That's going to break there. So there is a sweet spot there, but like there's something about the appreciation and beauty of some of the more expensive one-off guns as well. So, yeah, I think that, you know, everybody starts off somewhere, you know, 
And those cheap spear guns, there's a market for them. You know, the guys are just starting off and want to learn. And, you know, you can learn on one of those and use it for a season and, you know, shoot some fish and have a good time. And then then your buddy has a, an abellin hmm. and hands it to him and says, here, try this. And he pulls the trigger and he has, he's smiling from ear to ear. Yeah. And he goes, wow. Yeah. You know, because, you know, a, a, a newbie would never get that. If you gave a, somebody that never shot a gun before and gave him a perfectly balanced wood gun and said, here, go shoot it. Does he go, okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's all right. You know, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, wouldn't appreciate the, 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 dif- the difference there, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, it's sure. And, you know, but you take a, but it, like I said, you know, earlier, like a, you know, a great middle of the road gun is like a Rob Allen gun. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's tried and true to it. it, it you can take it out and you can shoot anything you want with that fish in the ocean. You know, you can go out there and have a good time and they're not super expensive and they, they last a long time. And, you know, what's, what's not to like about that. Mm-hmm. Hey, I want to ask you a little bit more about shafts and what triggered your infatuation with that, but I, let, I'm just conscious of wanting to hear your story as well. And, um, I know you started spearfishing maybe like at five years old, like both your parents speared. Um, what, what can you, can you remember like sort of how, how profound that sort of beginning was for you? I mean, to tell us a little bit about the experience. Well, you know, anybody that's ever gotten in the water for the first time, put a mask on, you know, your eyes are as big as the mask. You know, you're, you can't believe what you're seeing and that you're part of it and the way you interact with the fish and, the, you know, everything that's going on there. And then, you know, as you learn to hold your breath and go down and clear your ears and, you know, be relaxed in the water. And, and then when you get that weapon in your hand, you know, and you're, you're it's like it's like getting, when you when I was a little kid, I got a BB gun, went out to go shoot the BB gun in the backyard, you know. Yeah, yeah. And so now you get a spear gun and you're going to you're, you're go actually, you know, shoot a fish. And actually, my first gun wasn't a spear gun. It was a pole spear you know, like a Hawaiian sling type thing. So, um, and that's what I used, you know, at first, you know, just to kind of learn, learn with, but, you know, and that thing good right about those are is that they teach you how to get close to fish. You know, you don't have something that's going to shoot, you know, 20 feet across the room. You have something that you have to be, you know, at zero. So what you learn, you learn how to stalk, you learn how to get close to the fish, you learn how to fish reacts to you very well. And if you ever watch any of my videos on, on Instagram or anything, you'll see how close I get to fish. And everybody says, how do you get like that close to him? I go, well, you just, you just learn and you, you don't show emotion and you, you you slow everything way down. You slow all your movements down. You slow your heart rate down. You slow your eye movement down, you know, everything. And it, it really helps you get close. I mean, I, I, people always say, you know, I, I saw you down there. This Wahoo was like, you know, five feet from the end of your gun and you weren't pulling the trigger. And I go, I was just waiting till I had the perfect shot, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's what you do. You know, you, you learn to do that. If you've been spearfishing for longer than a year or two, you've probably heard a horror story of someone dying, likely from shallow water blackout. This is not uncommon. Almost every year people die spearfishing, doing what they love. And uh, a lot of these accidents are avoidable. And you can learn some simple techniques in order to minimize your chances of injury or blackout spearfishing by simply going to freedivingsafety.com and doing the free safety course there taught by Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving. Now the freediving safety course is comprehensive and it will not only make you a safer spearer, but it will also help you to have more fun and take home more fish. Check it out, freedivingsafety.com. One thing I'm sort of getting from you is like, I mean, you've you've had an infatuation that's allowed you to be very... um, patient and sort of slow in your progression and you've developed a whole lot of micro skills over the years but you're still quite well aware of some of the steps that that's taken one thing i guess a lot of people that start spearfishing these days is they seem to want to go from crawling to running very quickly i mean can you can you can you walk us through you know your process of picking up some of these smaller skills well i'll start let me back up a little bit on that so i i have I, I, I take a lot of new divers out diving. Like in you know, a lot, of, a lot of my friends are like, Who's this who's this guy coming today? And I go, He's some new guy. Where'd you meet him? I meet him on I met him on Instagram. And they're like, You're bringing some guy out here? I said, Yeah, this you know, it's cool. He's, he's seems like a decent guy. So we take him out and I'll spend some time with him and you know, whatever. But the whole thing is about slowing him down, you know, just slow everything down and you know, just watch me, watch me for twenty minutes, you know, and then try and evolve to that, you know. And you know, the, the big thing is just, um, you know, you just have to become one with the environment, you know, whether, whether it's hunting in, with a gun in, in the woods, you know, it's the same thing. You just have to learn to be, become part of it, you know, blend in and, 
you know, become a human camouflage, you know, just kind of blend in with everything and, 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 you know, watch, you know, you don't have to shoot, you have to pull the trigger every 30 seconds. You know, you, you want to wait to find the right fish and, you know, the right shot. Don't take a crappy shot. There is this weird sort of, I mean, I think it's part of what makes us love spearfishing so much, but there's this weird sort of thing. Like, because if you get in the water and your orientation is towards hunting and gathering, you've got to, like, because there are people that just want to look and there, there are those people, but I'm not one of them. And I don't think most people that are into spearfishing are. We're, we're people that want to be actively engaged with what we're doing and, you know, hunting and collecting just comes to us. But sort of those of us with that sort of, um, precondition like it's like we get in and we can't slow down it's like we see everything and we, we just want to do everything at once so learning that slowing down and actually having the patience to sit there and watch someone that's quite a big ask sometimes I think and um, but I mean what a what a bloody uh, great way to learn yeah it, it really is and you know so I, when somebody's new you know has never shot a spear gun before never been diving I say look you know you, you, you like you said earlier you know you, you, they want to go from from zero to USA or, or world champion overnight. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I became the USA national champion when I was 58 years old. Okay. <laughs> so, so it took me a while. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I, I, before that I became the Florida national in Florida over here in the United States, I became the Florida state champion and I'd been second or third place like 15 times, mm. you know, whatever. I'd always been in the, the win place or show, but I never had won it, you know? Mm. And it's just, um, you know, you, you, it takes, it's, it's a, it's a lifelong experience, like mm -hmm. a lifelong sport, you know, something that you get better at and, and you always keep learning. You never stop learning. You know, all the guys I dive with it, you know, we all keep learning every time we go out. It's always something we're changing something, yeah. adjusting something, you know, saying, Hey, did you see that? Did you see what happened there? And, you know, you, you just kind of learn. It's like a, it's like an Indian tribe. Yeah. You know, we all learn together how to, how to, you know, go out and hunt. Mm. Another thing I read about you, and I share this with you, is that um, The Last of the Blue Water Hunters by Carlos Isles. Is that a book you you, you spent a bit of time oh, reading? Oh, yeah. I've read it. Yeah, I read that book. And, you know, that's – it's kind of sad, you know, when, he, when the way he writes that book. You know, it's about, you know, like the end of, the, the end of you know, spearfishing as we know it. Mm. Um, but, you know, some of that stuff is, is true and some of it's, you know – kind of the, the greeny side of it, yeah. you know? Um, and, but, you know, one thing I've learned, I mean, you know, so my, you know, my, my name is, you know, red tide spear fishing, my, <laughs> my handle, like a spear board was red tide. You know, you wonder how I got that. Okay. Cause I kill everything in the ocean. You know? um, so that's, that's not too eco-friendly, mm. but, but what I've found is that, you know, you, um, you know, as you get older, you have a little bit more respect for it. And I'm a little bit more selective now mm. than I used to be, mm. you know, when I was younger and, you know, and I, and I don't burn out a spot. Like we, we mostly go on boats here. We don't go, we don't do shore dives here in Florida. Um, so we have spots and I've got like a thousand spots, you know, in my, my GPS and my boat. And, you know, I try not to go to the same spots, mm. you know, sometimes I have spots I haven't been to in two, three years, mm. you know, and we just kind of, you know, go to an area and work an area or wherever the clear water is, we try to find the good this, you know, yeah. but, but I, I manage, I manage my spots myself on my boat, you know, and, and, um, it's just my little, you know, my, my little country contribution and the same thing too, you know, we don't, you know, we don't shoot more fish than we're going to eat that week. Hmm. You know, we try not to go out anymore. And before I shoot enough fish to feed the whole village, you know, now I just shoot enough feed, fish to feed my family, you know, and, uh, you know, fish a couple of times. Cause you know, honestly, you can eat fish about two or three times a week and then you got to have some meat. Yeah. You know? Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. I recently did a multi-day trip um, to New Zealand and I actually ate seafood for four consecutive days and I enjoyed it the whole time, which is, you know, on other occasions, like I eat fish maybe twice in a four or five day trip. And I mean, that's kind of enough. I'm, I'm sort of, I'm tapped out. I'm like, I want to have a steak and um, as good as seafood and fish are, it's like, having it as a staple everyday food I don't know if it's realistic um with the way we've sort of adjusted to a red meat heavy diet yeah I'm, I'm not really red meat heavy but I gotta have it you know once in a while and I, I you know I have to have chicken and I gotta have pasta and I gotta have rice and I gotta have you know, yeah, yeah. stuff and the fish fits in there nicely but it's not my my only thing I eat you know I'm not I'm not a barracuda <laughs> it, it, it makes you grateful to be born in this this point of time where we're we're pretty bloody spoiled with um with you know the development and access to resources and different stuff i guess 
Yeah. You know, you guys are so lucky, like kind of like we are, your, your whole country surrounded by water in my state that I live in Florida is surrounded by water. So, you know, there's coastline miles and miles and miles and miles of coastline and there's, you know, great fish, you know, right there off the coast. And, you know, I, I live in St. Petersburg, Florida, which is the, the Western coast of the state of Florida. And, you know, some of the best fish in the States right here, you know, my backyard. Mm. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's really great. And, you know, when I was, I went to, um, uh, to Western Australia a few years back oh, wow. and, and dove that whole coast over there. I went to the Abrolhos Islands uh. and that was some cool, that was some of the coolest diving out there. I mean, the, first of all, okay. So I'm out there and I, I forgot what kind of fish it was I saw, but I, I shot him and the shaft went through him and hit one of those big pieces of Elkhorn coral and it broke it off and it fell to the bottom. And I was like, what a dickhead. <laughs> I just, that piece of coral has been growing there for like a thousand years. And I just broke it off. Yeah. You yeah. Know? But it's the most beautiful diving. And you guys have that right in your backyard. We have nothing like that over here. W- and WA is extreme, extremely amazing. I think, even, you know, like I'm on the East coast here and you know, the West coast is kind of a, is a dream for a lot of us, but um, yeah, some, yeah. some of the best, I think, um, you know, ocean conditions in the world. Yeah, it was really cool out there. And, you know, the southern part down there, um, like Dunsboro, down that way, um, it's, it's like the water's freezing cold down there. And they have great white sharks. And, you know, it's it's kind of a sketchy place to go. You know, I did a tournament there. And that was like one of the sketchiest things I've ever done was that we had, a, a, it was the Interpac uh, tournament. Okay. You know, those all the Pacific Islands yep. kind of all get together and kind of have a tournament. And I was representing Hawaii. They had me on the Hawaiian team. And, it was me and Mark Healy and Marty Balabar and Capona Zukovic. And we, we talked about this before on one of the other podcasts, I think, but hmm. you know, it, there was, there was a 16 foot swell oh. that day. <laughs> and we, and, and, Mark, and so Capono and Marnie were diving the, the swell side, the, that side and Mark and I, cause we're the strong swimmers. We swam two miles out to these indicator rocks that were like two miles out. And we swam hand over hand, fist over fist, as hard as we could possibly dive, swim for two miles. And we got out there. We're the first team to get there. And we got there and it took me 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes to calm down enough for to even dive. I, mean, I was puffing and puffing. My face was beat red. I was like, I thought I was going to have a heart attack out there, you know? Yeah. And that was so hard. And then we got, and we got all these fish on our stringers. You know, we were loaded up with fish. We got everything. We, went, we shot those big Samson fish. We call them Amberjack here, but we shot some Samson fish out there. Yep. And we had, them, we had to drag these things back two miles back across that bay, back to the, the finish. Well, afterwards, they were talking about stories that in that day, like the year before, these two divers got ground up there by, by great whites. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm glad they told me this afterwards and not before. <laughs> you know, I would have never done it. <laughs> Gee, because that is one of the sketchy things about those un, unsupported um, shore dive spearfishing comps. I, I, I didn't really think about that, particularly in that part of the world. Gee, because there's, um, there's some big great white sharks down there. Yeah, crazy stuff. You know, we have crazy sharks here too, though, because now they, they ban shark fishing. And so now the sharks, when you go out the bull sharks you have over here and those things are super aggressive. And, you know, in fact, I had a friend get bit on Saturday or Sunday, just yesterday. Oh, wow. Yeah. Sunday yesterday. He got bit on, on the ankle. Um, he was diving down in the, in the Florida Keys and a bull shark, a big bull shark got a hold of him and, you know, bit his ankle. And he was getting the fish out of a rock. The fish had rocked up and then like 50 feet of water and he was pulling it out and he was like halfway inside the rock. And all of a sudden something grabbed his ankle and, uh, you know, didn't, 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 did all it did was like 11 stitches and maybe did a little tendon damage, but it didn't, it didn't bite his leg off, but it could have, you know, they, and, they seem to get extra confident in dirty water, which you guys get there as well. That's, that's the thing that, you know, my, my rule is as soon as you see a shark, we go to a different spot. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to share a spot with the sharks unless you're in a comp. And if you're in a comp then we get it, what you guys call them smokies over there. Um, yeah. So, you know, we, we, we'll clear the way if we have to, uh, but bronzies. Yeah. 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 There's heaps of different yeah. names for the tax, man. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so bull sharks are the, the primary sort of problem child out there. Yeah. Bull sharks and, you know, tiger sharks sometimes. I think tiger shark, I think most of the sharks are more just when you see them, you get scared about them. Like you see a big tiger shark. I saw in Hawaii, I was doing a shore dive in Hawaii and I had, I'm not exaggerating. I had a, 16 foot tiger shark mm. come up the thing had to weigh 1500 pounds mm. and i had two wahoos on my stringer <laughs> and i'm about a mile i'm about a mile offshore oh, no. and me and my buddy were out there my buddy was kind of a newbie he wasn't you know too too super experienced i said come on we can be, be fun come on let's go and he goes all right so you know, so we go out there and 
this shark showed up and he goes, Hey, it's right behind you. I look up and the, the shark spins out of the water, like in the movies, you know, like oh, it's sticking man. out of the surface. And he's coming toward me and I look down in the water and go, Oh my God, this thing is huge. And I put my gun out in front of me and I was like, what am I going to do? You know, I, there's, there, first of all, there was no place on that shark. You could shoot him and kill him. It, it would be like finding a 300 pound man, like, like a muscle man and, and trying to punch him somewhere. And I'll sucker punch him and knock him out. It never happened. You know? <laughs> so I said, all right, here's my fish. I took my stringer off and just let it go. And the fish started, you know, floating down and the shark followed it down. And we swam on our backs all the way back to the shore. Yeah. Like looking side to side, back to back looking, you know. Mm-hmm. And we got back to the shore and we said, man, that was crazy. You know, that's the craziest thing I've ever seen, you know. So, um, but I, honestly, I don't know if that shark would have really come after us or not. Mm-hmm. You know, he might have, but he was so big and so ominous. And I had fish and he was a shark, you know. And you put yourself in those roles and, what would, you know, what, what would you do? What would the shark do? You yeah. Know? Yeah, no, it's that. It's an, inter- it's an interesting scenario. I think sometimes we've got cute answers for um for everything, but when you're in those situations, that's when the the rubber hits the road, so to speak. Um, I was going to ask you, like, you know, we've talked. You talked a lot about slowing down and getting new guys to slow down. Another problem, you know, and I have it still is like occasionally you you'll be in rough water, or maybe with a combination of cold and exertion, and maybe some white water, and then you've got to try and hold your breath, slow down get calm and shoot a fish. Um, and I think part of that's this, this, this self-mastery process that spearfishing enforces on all of us. But, I mean, how do you calm your anxiety? Because, like, I was out the other day and um, my heart rate, I had a dive watch on for a change, which is different, and my heart rate was on 100 and I just couldn't seem to get it down. And I mean, after about three hours of diving, I was back down to about 60 when I was just on my breathe up and maybe getting down back down to 50 or something. But it was crazy, and I, I couldn't really control it. And I was trying some techniques to try and relax the stuff. Do you have anything for when you're in those situations? You know, I, I think what happens in those situations too. You, you've probably noticed this, and some of the guys listening have probably noticed this. You know, some days you dive like like you're the best diver in the world, and other days you just totally suck. Yeah. And and I don't know what it is. I mean, I can't tell you. I mean, you know, I'm a I'm a 150 foot free diver with a spear gun in my hand. Wow. You know, when I have to, when I have to, when I have to, hmm. I was diving yesterday in 110 feet of water, you know, shooting African pompanos on a deep wreck. And we, and we were in 160 was the depth of the bottom, you know, and, but the thermal climb was down there and that's where I had to go to get the fish. And, you know, I was diving not that good. Um, I, I wasn't feeling good. I wasn't, you know, my drops were like a minute 40, you know, normally I do like in that kind of stuff. I do like two thirty. Yeah. So my, my two minutes, 30 seconds, wow. you know? And I just wasn't calmed down. I wasn't, you know, feeling relaxed and, you know, and I don't push it. When I get like that, I just go, okay, well, I'm just going to just not go that deep. I'm not going to try that hard. And like you said, a little later, I got a little more relaxed and what have you. And, um, but some days it just isn't your day, mm. you know, some days you can't make it happen and, and, and never push it, you know, never, never try and make it happen. You know, one thing, okay. So you've been with different guys. I, I hate when I get a, a somebody new on that, that I'm diving with and they go, you know, I have to go hundred feet today. I've never been a hundred feet. I want to go hundred feet. I have to go hundred feet. I go, have you lost your mind? You know, just go whatever, you know, you're comfortable with. Yeah. Don't, don't push, you know, don't, don't try that. And you know, people ask me, how deep do you go? I, I mean, I, how many times you know, people say, Oh, you free dive? How long do you hold your breath? And how deep do you go? Yeah. First of all, I don't know how long I hold my breath. I've never tried. Mm. Mm. Okay. I don't know. I mean, I, I hold it for as long as it takes me to shoot a fish and mm. I feel comfortable mm. and you know, and how deep do I go? I don't, I just go as deep as I have to, to get a fish, you know? And, and yeah, there's a point where it gets like the squeeze gets on me and I start feeling very uncomfortable. That's like, like around 120 feet, you know, my mask is smashed against my face and my, my eye, my eyeballs are actually touching the glass on my, my mask. And I go, okay, it's time to go up. Mm. You know, I've had enough of this. <laughs> it's not comfortable. I'm not having fun now. I was, and so, you know, you, I mean, just just related with what you're talking. About, I was talking with a you know like a world class freediver a while ago, and he was talking about how when you train to your limits and you train through that comfort zone all the time, and you're always pushing the envelope, even in a competitive environment where you've got safety divers and stuff like that. He said by training like that and competing like that all the time, he developed scar tissue in his brain and he had like a negative association with breath hold. And um, so he would get in the pool to just do his normal, you know, diving and, and, he, and he would just start feeling anxious and things like that. I think you can build a negative association if you don't just slow down and relax and enjoy your diving. And um, 
there's something to be said for diving with um, egotistical people too that that put pressure on new divers, and um, like that, right. like they're not enough or they're not good enough. And I think, you know, that's that's something that a lot of us that are, have been going a little bit longer need to, you know, we need to make the new guys just feel comfortable doing what they they can actually, you know, reasonably do. Yeah, you know, I mean, as I've gotten older, you know, I'm I've kind of taken on the role as mentor, you know, mm. for like a lot of divers mm. and. Um, it's, it's been kind of cool. I mean, I enjoy it. I enjoy the coaching aspect of it. You know, I enjoy that. And I enjoy, um, I enjoy seeing their faces. You know, I don't have kids, you know, so I, 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 I enjoy, you know, seeing the, the, the new guys, you know, come into the sport and get amped up because I'm amped up as you can tell, just talking to me. I mean, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm like super stoked. I'm always, I'm always like that. I'm always on the, 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 the high side of this thing, you know? Mm-hmm. And so it's fun when you, you see new guys come into the sport and they got that same, the same thing that I've never lost. And, you know, the, the cool thing too about this sport, as you've probably seen, is that there's not a lot of people that get out of it. Hmm. I mean, most people get in it and they stay in it. Hmm. You know, you don't see a lot of divers that get out of it. You know, they, they come in and they do it and they go, wow, this is pretty cool. And they keep, and they, they, they all evolve and keep getting better and better and better hmm. and, you know, doing more and more and more. And, and that's kind of, that's, that's a neat thing about this sport is it's, it's a really a sport for everybody, yeah. you know? Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I, I've seen a few people burn out, and a lot of it's, um, I think it's a lot of it's social media induced. Like if you just continue to look at just dead fish all day on Facebook, thousands of people scroll or, or Instagram just scrolling and scrolling. Like oh, that, that's why I like people that share the stories and the stoke and the filleting and all the other surrounding stuff around spearfishing. Because if it's just people holding up fish, sometimes you can it can fatigue a little bit. I had a year and a half away from spearing, and I came back and I. I didn't choose. I, I was overseas in a country where it was very difficult to do it. And um, But I realized that I never want to live away from the ocean again, and spearfishing is always going to be a part of my life. You've, you've had some time away from spearing as well, though. Yeah, I took off. I mean, so when I was in high school, um, you know, I, I, I was a runner, and I ran track, and I got a college scholarship to University of Texas in, you know, Austin, Texas. Mm. And you know, I was an Olympic hopeful. That was my, my dream is to, you know, be an Olympic runner. And, um, it didn't happen, you know, it didn't happen for me, hmm. but you know, it was that time away where that's pretty much all I did was run. Um, I come home in the summertime and I and spear, you know, a couple of times with my buddies or whatever, but not like, you know, not like it all the time. And, and then when I got back from, from college, you know, I got a job right, right away. And I was a 60 hour week job. And, you know, I, 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 I still lived on the water, you know, on Tampa Bay and, and it was in my backyard. So it was always kind of convenient, but you know, I didn't go all the time. And back then I, I wasn't as amped up, you know, I mean, I loved it, but it wasn't like my whole life, you know, um, <laughs> I got on a motor, I got on a motorcycle racing. I was racing dirt bikes. Oh, wow. I did that for years and that pretty much was all consuming except when the, you know, when the weather was really nice and I go out diving with my buddies and we dive a little bit, but what really got me going like what really took over and made me like go into full on spearfishing was, um, uh, I saw a flyer in a dive shop and it said, there's going to be a spearfishing competition. And I go, I've never heard of such a thing. What's a spearfishing competition. I never even knew there cause there was no internet. There was no whatever. Mm. And I, I didn't know there, there were some magazines back then, but I never knew what they were, you know? And I went, I go, well, you know, I could, we could do that. I told my buddies, and I said, we, we should do this. <laughs> so we went to this competition and we didn't know shit from Shinola. We didn't know what we were doing. You know? <laughs> and we show up and there's these guys, they're like national champions, mm. you know, guys that have done, been in the world championships and, you know, and these guys are serious as all get out. And I'm, I'm you know, me, I'm, just, I'm always laughing, happy guy, fun guy, you know, these guys, they, they want to go kill the world. I'm like, wow, these guys are serious. <laughs> and uh, so we went in that competition and our, my team got third place and we missed first place by less than one pound of fish. That's like a half a kilo of fish. We missed by that much. And I said, Hey, we we're good. We can do this. You know, we we're we're going to be really good. So I met these guys there and we started talking about spearfishing and there were some local guys and they'd been to some tournaments. And next thing you know, you start meeting all these people. Hmm. They were like, there's another whole world out there outside of your friends. Yeah, for sure. And and these guys were on all different levels, you know, like above me, below me, around me, whatever. But, you know, mm. and so we started talking about spearfishing more and I started diving with these guys and, and they took me to the deep end of the pool. You know, I'd never been in the deep end of the pool. I mean, I was yeah. free diving in 30 feet, 35 feet of water. They took me out to a wreck in 70 feet of water and said, man, there's fish all over the bottom. I go, 
fuck that. <laughs> you know? yeah. So by the, by the end of the day, I was going 70 feet and, you know, wondering how I was going to get back to the surface, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. And um, so, but, you know, then that group of us all kind of grew together. You know, we all became good friends and we started diving all the time. And, and then we started, you know, back then it was magazine. We get spearing magazine or spearfishing magazine. They come out like once, a, once a quarter or once a year. And we'd read the articles about these guys in Australia or these guys in New Zealand or these guys, wherever shooting these big fish. We're like, that is so cool. You know, I want to do that. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's just a, it's such a wonderful thing. This, this sport, you know, how it goes, but back to Instagram. So you mentioned Instagram. Yeah, yeah. So, or, or Facebook or whatever. And they're always guys holding fish. Mm. The one thing I hate most about that, is that I still work a six day a week job. Mm. You know, I'm still working all the time yeah. and I go on there and get, I get in the scroll and start seeing all these fish and I get the worst case of FOMO ever. You know, all these guys, I don't think they ever work. Yeah, like some yeah. of them are like trust fund babies or whatever. They're out there diving every day and they're spearing fish every day. And, and it's like, damn, does that guy ever work? Mm. Does he ever, what does he do? You know, for a living. I've got buddies like this too. Yeah, it doesn't really matter, you know. You just as long as you're having a good time, who cares? You know, that's what I say. It's just, just have a good time. One other thing that's probably similar with mine and your part of the world, I think, is the fact that um, we've got to get on a boat and then we've got to head out somewhere. And generally, when you go for a diving, it then turns into at least a half day to a full day affair. But a lot of the guys that seem to dive every day have access to very easy spots, and they can get them for an hour and a half and just have a spare during the week. And uh, for me, it's like I think last year I got maybe twenty dive days in the whole year and uh, but they were they were full days out diving and um, I'm trying to do more of it and sort of move my life so I can get out diving more I like to get out at least sort of twice a month but um, it, it depends where you live and what you have access to so listen to this so yesterday I told you we went diving yesterday mm. um, we went 90 miles out yep yeah do the kilos on that one yep Kil- <laughs> kilometers on that 150 one. Okay. or something yeah um, yeah so um, we left at 4 30 in the morning Yep. And I got home last night at 1044. <laughs> and you know how I know that? Because my girlfriend said, you know what time it is? It's 1044. <laughs> 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 and I was back at work this morning at nine o'clock, you know, with, uh, I have a hundred employees and they're all like going crazy and, you know, in my face all day. And we got this COVID-19 thing going on yeah. and everybody's wearing face masks and, hmm. you know, it's just, it's crazy. Yeah, it's it just, is, the world's man. crazy. But, but yesterday, I mean, like I spent, you talk about a full day. I don't know. No, I haven't done the math on that. What's four, what's what's four thirty in the morning until ten forty four at night? Oh, you know? Eighteen hours, <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> and I was and I was still laughing and smiling yeah, when I came yeah, home. Yeah. You know, I wasn't tired at all. Yeah. The, the, it was like, a great day. The, another thing I've been reading lately is um, there's this audio book that I've been reading. Um, it's called um, Becoming Superman or something like that by Stephen Kotler and he sort of talks with dudes like Mark Healy and some of your other buddies there but one of the things all of these dudes seem to have and ladies have in common is um, entering this flow state and I think when you're doing shit you love you know whether it's whatever it is you know for us it's spearfishing um, time doesn't matter and and it doesn't and and it doesn't matter at all and you, you know we still like to have awesome people around us but um, the activity itself is just enough to keep you firing on all eight cylinders to, to into the wee hours of the morning I think yeah you know you have that that personality you know that, that does that and you know for me as a kid you know growing up I mean I, I look at sports that I've done you know and as a kid I was a, I was I was in judo and very competitive in judo yeah um, I got into running track was very competitive at that. Got into racing motorcycles, very competitive at that. Got into spearfishing, got into tournaments, got very competitive at that. You know, it's just that that thing, but it's always a passion. You know, you just get this passion about something that you're doing and you're working toward a toward a goal. And um, so it makes that that whole time thing when you're out there. Like yesterday, those those 18 hours, to me, it was like, to me or you, it would be like five minutes. You know, it was like the whole day went by and it clicked. You know, it was just boom. And it's, it's really, really cool to, to get you your element and put you in that element and, and, and I'm, I'm one of these dudes and maybe you're the same like I, I tend to ha- find an interest or a passion and I get obsessed and I dedicate a hell of a lot of time to it and I generally try to be pretty good at it and I spend a fair bit of time and energy becoming good at it um, I still find myself these days between work and family and um, spearfishing but I also do you know some other things as well like jujitsu and it's hard to get good and stay good at everything when you've only got this finite resource called time um, is that something you can relate to? Well, probably not because you're just, you're so good at spearfishing. 
No, no for me, it's like, you know, I'm very, car- I'm, I'm a typical male. Yeah. Okay. I'm very compartmentalized, you know? Yeah. So I'm in the, like for you, I'd be in the jiu-jitsu mode. Okay. And I do that as much as I can and do whatever. And then I get into the spear fishing mode and I do that as much as I can, whatever. Oh, I forgot about work. I have to get in the work mode. I have to do that as much as I can, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and by the way, you have to come home and be a, home, be a good husband, a good father. Yeah. You know, do that as much as you can. You know, but you have to balance all that stuff out. Yeah. You know, it's all part of it. And, it yeah. and it's hard balancing it out when you get so, I'm a, bit, a little bit like you, I think. You get you get this extreme focus on this one thing and then sometimes that means naturally that the other things get neglected in, in order to do that one thing, you know, really well. So it's a, it's a funny old balance, I think, um, trying to get it all right. And I, I forgot who taught it to me, but they talk about like your life, you know, and here we're going to get philosophical. Yeah, that's Nothing fine. Nothing to do with spear That's fine. You're, you're guys, your guys are going to tune out nah, right now. Nah, nah. But, we love it all. But but, you know, but, but our, all of our lives are like a, like a bicycle wheel. Hmm. Okay. You got all these spokes and each one of those spokes has a name on it. The name is jiu-jitsu, spearfishing, family, friends, you know, work, time off, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And what happens is if you get too far out in any one of those areas, your wheel gets unbalanced. And then you start feeling the wobble. You start feeling the, the, the imbalance in your life. And so you have to always kind of manage that, that wheel. And, you know, I, I tell salesmen that work for me, I say, you know, some of you guys, you, you, you work 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, guess what? You're going to come home. Your wife's not going to be there. Your kids won't know your name and whatever. You got to, you got to live a balanced life. And, you know, spearfishing, you know, like yesterday at 18 hours. Okay. So I took 18 hours on my, my day off. And that's a hundred, that's 110% the wrong direction. You know what I mean? I'm just like going, <laughs> I'm going my way and that's it. You know, that day yeah. and you need to balance it back out. You can't just be that, that, that's that into it. And I think, um, I think one thing with spearfishing though, is it's sort of like, um, it feeds your soul, you know? So like, it gives you more, like for me personally, like I get a day out diving, I'm, 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 I'm kinder to people when I come back and I've got a lot more in- energy and time and love for the, the people and other activities in my life that demand attention. So yeah, um, me, and my, me and my buddies talk about that all the time. You know, it's like, you know, Sunday, you know, that's like our, our going to church, you know, we go out there, we come back and we're, we have a whole new outlook on how we should treat everybody yeah. and be around everybody. We're just like super cool and chill. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, it's great. I, I go to church as well, but I will give up a day of church for a day of spear fishing. <laughs> <laughs> you, you and I both, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Buying a set of spearfishing fins can be quite a huge decision. When you finally decided to get off the plastic blades and head into either composites or carbon fiber, you want to make sure that you're making the right decision. I've got a couple of tips and pointers to you brought today, brought to you by penetratorfins.com. Now, when you buy a set of carbon fiber or composite fins, you want to make sure that it's comfort paired with efficiency but you also want longevity out of it because it's a huge investment. Now, sometimes the lightest fin in the world may feel great, but think about what that fin's gonna look like in three years of of hardcore spearfishing use. Will the fin still be doing the job that you want it to in three years? Make sure also that you get exactly the right size foot pockets and wear the dive socks like when you try them on that you will be wearing with them in the pool in the ocean and that way you'll have a really good idea you don't want any slop or play in the pocket when you when you when you when you fit the pockets and when you make sure when you're buying it you want you want them tight but you don't want to restrict circulation either because you can all end up with all sorts of cramping issues getting that that the blade pocket partnership right is crucial as well if you head in if, or if you talk to larry gray at penetratorfins.com he will not do you wrong his before and after sales service is beyond compare as is his warranty it's australian made you can't go wrong check it out penetratorfins.com if you do decide to purchase for a limited time only it's a 25 dollars off any set of fins penetratorfins.com check them out Hey, um, I want to tie back into our interview, and um, I mean we've we've gone in heaps of directions, which is fantastic. Um, but I wanted to chat a lot about 
travel spearfishing in particular. It's a passion of yours. Um, so this is going to make this our veterans vault a section of the show where we, we go deep into a, you know our featured guest area of expertise. Travel spearfishing, um, we've talked a lot about the passions and the drivers for it and um, obviously social media has opened up a, a, a world of possibilities for a lot of us. We go, oh wow, that guy's in, in Tahiti or whatever it is. You know, French Polynesia, I'm going to go there and shoot a huge wahoo. Um, is, how do you plan and prepare for travel spearfishing and, and where did this passion come from? So, so for me, it started a long time ago. Um, kind of found out about blue water hunting. Okay. So let's just take that. That's my passion, you know, hunting blue water fish. I mean, reef, reef fish in your backyard. That's like, that's hunting reef fish in your backyard, you know, but there's fish out there like, you know, like a grander marlin, you know, that's like a fish that, you know, captivates anybody. You know, whether you're a hook and line fisherman or a, or a, a spear fisherman, you know, anybody would love to get a grander marlin. Like some Aussie guys got an 800 pound marlin in Ascension Island a couple of years ago, I think it was. Yeah, that was my buddy from down the road. <laughs> yeah. His name's John yeah. John Regan. I think I don't know if it got yeah. it was a world record, but yeah. But but it's crazy, you know. That's like some fish that's like just you know unbelievable dinosaur. And you know, well, so let's go back to the travel. So I, I've always been a kind of a student of the, the business and. So for me to pick out what kind of fish do I want to like, what, what are my dream fish? You know, what, what fish do I want to get? You know, I want to get a grander marlin. Okay. Where would you get a grander marlin? It's a question you ask yourself. So, you know, I go on, instead of trying to find it through the spearfishing community, the spearfishing community is very small. You go to the fishing community and you these guys, there's, there's, there's a hundred times more of them than there are of us. And you go to the, the IFGA world records and you see when they caught these fish, where they caught these fish, how they caught these fish. And you just, I become a student of that. And like, where, where are the giant Marlin caught? Well, guess where they're caught? Ascension Island, mm. you know? So years before Ascension Island became a spearfishing destination, I was, I was circling around that, that destination with my buddies, Cameron Kirkconnell. Okay. Um, Brad Thornbow. Um, a couple of us were talking about you know, Mark Healy. We're talking about, you know, where would you get a grander marlin? And I'm like, Ascension Island. Let me show you this. And I had like a, a magazine that had talked about it. I, I went to the IFGA. I researched it. I got all this stuff. I said, this is where they catch them. You know, they, this guy caught five of them in two weeks. You know, this is the place that, that they have. Them. Or, you know, where would you get a, a giant dog tooth tuna? And, you know, I said, okay, well, there's this place off of Africa. That they catch them hook and line. And, you know, they, they've caught them there like, you know, 200, 220, 230 pounders. I said, well, if hook and line guys catch them 220, 230, a spear fisherman could catch one bigger. Well, my buddies went over there and they got two of them at 240 the first day, you know, like boom. So, and then now, you know, you hear other places where they get this big giant doggies. Mm. And, you know, it's in Polynesia, one of those 1800 islands over there. And, you know, and so you find out from the fishermen where they catching them, what they're doing. And you kind of, I use that at, that's my guide like around the world. So like, where do you get the giant yellow fin tuna? Where do you get the giant, you know, blue fin tuna? Where do you get the giant, you know, whatever. And for me, I, I, I swear all the time, like, where do you get the giant dolphin? You know, like a mahi mahi, where would you find one of those? And I like to target those fish. You know, for me, it's just like, like because it's a lifelong thing for me, you know, I want to catch that. I want to catch that, that 70 pound mahi mahi. I want to catch that 300 pound doggy. You know, I want to catch that thousand pound marlin. I want to catch that that crazy big fish. Mm. And okay, you know, and I'm willing to that, that. Go ahead. Okay, so you, you you're finding data, and a lot of it's coming from sort of line fishing sources. You you're looking at times of year, size of fish, volume of fish, and a lot of that's coming out of line fishing. And then you're sort of maybe reaching out through your network and magazines and stuff, and you're confirming that sort of knowledge. When you've got a a, a theory about a place and a time of year, um, what's your next steps from there? Well, from there, then you got to find somebody that'll take you out. You know, because a lot of these fishermen they don't want anything to do with a diver. You know. So, you know, you start to contact them and, you know, you send them an email and say, Hey, blah, blah, blah. I'd like to schedule a trip on these dates. And they say, okay, those dates are open. And I say, okay, here's what, here's what I'd like to do. <laughs> I'd like to bring <laughs> me and a of my buddies with float lines and grease and spear guns. And we want to shoot one of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they're like, no way. And I go, yeah, way. And, you know, so You've... It's, it's kind of funny so you, you 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 it's a little bit like a cheeky one you find out if they're available before you um tell yeah. them what it is that you yeah. want to do love it um exactly what about um 
So for first time blue water hunters, I mean, do you recommend that they go out with a, a, a dedicated spearfishing guide? Because you're talking about quite an advanced level of sort of travel and spearfishing. You're talking about, you know, planning your own thing, booking a boat and a service for yourself. And because you already know how to hunt these things and you know what gear you need and all the rest of it. For guys that are at the other end of the spectrum, do you recommend they go with a guide? You know, guide, spearfishing guides are something new. They've kind of come on in like the last five years or so. Um, there weren't really spearfishing guys five years ago. Hmm. You know, think about it. Who, who were they? I don't, I don't know who they were. And I have friends that, that do that now for a living. Hmm. You know, that's, that's what they do. And so, you know, there's, there's guides out there now and, and it's good. I mean, you know, the one, the one thing about the internet and the one thing about guides is they'll take something that might take you a lifetime to figure out and they can condense it down into a, a short period of time. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you can, you know, stuff that took me years and years and years to figure out, you know, you can figure out in a weekend, yeah. you know, in a week on vacation, you know, but, but finding those places to go and, you know, where the fish are and the time of year and what moon that they're on here. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quick one. Mm -hmm. This this is kind of good for all the guys. Mm -hmm. you know, years ago, I found out about the elephant tuna, you know, and I was in Costa Rica and I was down there fishing. We actually were down there marlin fishing. And, uh, I saw, we saw this giant, you know, bait ball getting just devoured by, by spinner dolphin and tuna. And I, I'm in the, I'm in the, the tower with the captain. I go, man, look at all those tuna jumping over there. And he goes, yeah. He says, he, he looks at them like they're like nothing. Like it's like, we're not here to get tuna. We're here to get Marlin. And I go, well, how big do those tuna get? And he goes, oh, they get like three, 400 pounds. I go a three, 400 pound yellowfin tuna. Are you kidding me? And he goes, no. And I went, well, I got it. So I, I quickly, I told you a little story about making my own tuna guns and all that stuff mm. and whatever. But so then I go to the, I go to the IFGA records and I look at when they're caught. What's, what's the date of the catch? So I look at that date. I don't care if it's 20 years ago. I, I find out what the full moon was 20 years ago. Mm. And I find out what the date was and where, where they caught the fish in relationship to the moon. Well, what I found on yellowfin tuna is that every yellowfin tuna ever caught that was a world record and every yellowfin tuna ever, ever, that was ever speared as a world record was got around five days before the full moon. Ah, very interesting. Now, how crazy is that? That's crazy. So how do you plan your trip? <laughs> do you want to shoot yellowfin tuna? Do you want to shoot yellowfin tuna? You plan your trip, you know, like, like seven days, six days, five days, four days before the full moon. And you're like in that, that zone right there. That's when you want to be in the water. Mm -hmm. And same thing for doggies. I've, I've done that. And it works for doggies. They're not on the full moon. They're not, they're not on the uh, five days before. They're on the full moon. Mm -hmm. You know, wahoos, they're on the full moon. There's certain fish that are on it and certain fish that are off of it. Marlin, Marlin are like five days after the full moon. Okay. It's like, but it's funny how you, you, when you, once, once you figure out that cycle of all these fish, like when do you get them? How do you get them? And it, it's cool. And then it's not just the moon. It's also the time of the year. So certain times of the year, it could be like the full moon in June here in Florida. They have things for the, the, the mutton snappers. They spawn on the full moon in June. Okay. And so that's, so that's when you go to get mutton snappers, you know, and like the yellowfin tuna, you got to figure out when their when their spawn is or when their their time is. At each country around the world is different, but once you find that out, once you break that code, then you know. Mm. And like last year, some guy shot a four hundred and eighty pound yellowfin tuna in the Dominican Republic. Well, I can tell you right now that I I was like full on like a the spearfishing detective. <laughs> okay, I was I was googling every single thing you could possibly think of. I know what marina was at. I know how much gas he had in his boat. I know who was on the boat. I know what they had for lunch that day. Okay. So, I get really dialed in when I hear something like that because I want to know everything about it and how it happened and why it happened. Mm. You know, I've got. I still don't have the answer. I've got a mate who does this to me. Like if if he knows I've gone out spearfishing, he gives me a call and he just finds out all the details. And I, I think some of the the, the most effective spearfishing and uh, spearfishers in terms of results are the ones that put in the research, but. There's also it's also frowned on when you share knowledge. Like if I go out with three of my mates and some of my other mates ask me, "Oh, um, you know, what was out there today? Where did you go? And, and you know, what did you see?" And if I give them that data, it's like some of my other mates that are out with sometimes they get dirty. Do you do you do you find this sort of little crossover as well? Yeah, I have certain friends that have no problem with that. I have other friends they say, "Oh, where'd you go? Oh, I went uh, northeast." 
and I actually went Northwest <laughs> or they say, where'd you go? And I went, Oh yeah, we were in 30 to 40 feet of water. Meanwhile, I was in 90 to hundred. Yeah, you know, yeah. They'll be on inter- Instagram tomorrow with the GPS coordinates on, on printed on their picture that they put on there yeah. where they were. And you know, it's mm. like, stuff. it's crazy. Mm. You know, be careful when you're out there putting pictures up mm. because your pictures have what they call geotags on them. Yeah. I was going to mention geotags, they, they, They've got the, everything on there. I, I've actually gone on a, a thing where a guy put his fish up there. I looked at it, went there, and we went to the same spot and we crushed the fish. There. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's brutal. That's brutal. Yeah, geotagging. Like if you if you take a, a photo on any sort of digital device and it's not an airplane mode, it records all of the GPS data and and it's Im- so embedded you, in them. Crop, 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 crop the photo, okay, and then email it to yourself and then save it. And then it, it's all the stuff gets just it gets oh, taken off. There. Wow. Ah, nice, <laughs> nice. I like that. Hey, okay. So we've got we've got this this data set. I mean, and we know where we're going, when we're going, and we've we've coerced a, a fishing charter uh, into going. How many divers do you take? Who do you take? Well, that's the, the most. I usually go with two other guys. Usually three of us go, and that's that's it. We kind of the, years ago we do groups of four. But groups of four doesn't work out real good when you're doing these things, you know, like as far as who's in the boat and is in the water and all that stuff. And, but three, three things seems to be the perfect number on, on these trips. So the guys I take, you know, obviously now the guys I take are not, I don't take, you know, they, you got to be pretty dialed in, have your, you know, your act together. Um, you got to have cash, you know, I don't want anybody, you know, you got to, you know, pay the money up front and do it all. And, and what have you, I, I've got, I've got deposits right now on two trips over $10,000 of my own money tied up right now on trips mm. that I can't go on because of this COVID thing, Yeah, right. you know? And so it's kind of crazy out there right now, but anyway, so three, three of us total, um, you know, and we're, we're you, always three guys that they get along, you know, we have to always get along good and, and be the same mindset. And, you know, I, I'm not, you know, when I was young, I was a party guy, you know, now I'm just kind of like, I'm a, I'm the, I'm a gold guy. Kind of like my, my buddies will go out and party or whatever. But me, I, I stay back in the room. And I, like when I get done diving at the end of the day, there's not much left. <laughs> you know, I'm pretty wore out. <laughs> now, I'm always, I'm always the first one up in the morning. I'm always the first one to go to bed at night, you know? So, um, I get them all going and, you know, get everybody up and running. Do you take, um, any of those hydration, um, packets of stuff like, and add that to your water? Um, no, I don't. I just drink water. Um, I drink a lot of it. I drink a lot of water. Um, and I eat and I have bananas in the boat every time I go. Like I love it. The guys that are like anti bananas. I I've never been to sea one time ever in the last fifty five years where I didn't have bananas in the boat. You Excellent. Know? Love it. So, so so all those guys that are anti bananas, you guys are a bunch of idiots. <laughs> um <laughs> I am um, like in New Zealand and Australia I grew up in New Zealand and moved to Australia, but both countries are um like very not superstitious, um, but I find that older cultures, um, people are very um, superstitious, and the banana things just seems like a hangover from from bygone days to me. So I, I'd take bananas too, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna well, you know, tell my bananas mates. are great. Or, or, yeah, but bananas are great to eat. You know, when you're diving, I mean, you can eat like a, I eat like a half a banana like mid morning, eat another, eat the other half like around lunchtime, eat another half in the afternoon. You know. And, and that gives you all the, you know, the energy that you need with the water, hmm. you know, and I think, you know, drinking a lot of water is, is really big when you're, you know, exerting like that and what have you, you don't realize how much you, you're, you're exerting, how much you're sweating and how much you're, you know, um, peeing, your, how much you're peeing in your wetsuit, you know. <laughs> I, I find um, I lose a lot of magnesium and essential salts, I think. And that's so I have been taking the um, hydration tabs. And I find that when I get back now, I'm nowhere near as exhausted as I have been in previous days. And I tried drinking a lot more water as well, but it, it only worked to a certain point. And then, um, and then these, yeah, those hydration tabs have, have changed the game for me. That's why I asked you. But I guess maybe the potassium in bananas is um, having, a, is having yeah. a good effect. It's, it's the potassium and, and there's a little bit of a, you know, it's potassium and there's also, you know, a little bit of carbohydrate in there mm. just kind of, you know, keep, keep you up and keep you going. Yeah. Good, useful sugar as well, for sure. No, yeah. cool. Um, so, I mean, you, you went over a couple of the sort of characteristics of good dive buddies to have on a trip. What about, um, actual diving behavior? Uh, once again, you want guys that, like for me, I want guys on the trip that are calm and not, not the crazy divers, you know, and I want the guy who's a dive bomber, who scares all the fish away. And, you know, one of the big things too is you don't want that guy on the trip 
like, let's say you're on a doggy trip. Okay. And you're, you know, you're halfway across the world and you've, you know, you've spent thousands of dollars to get there and to do this trip and you get that first spot and, you know, a hundred pound doggy swims up right up, right up in front of him and he shoots it. Well, you just turn that whole place off. Mm. You know, as soon as you shoot that fish, you know, the other ones all, they all hop, they all take off. Mm. I mean, yeah, they may stay around or whatever, but it's not the same deal. When you're, when you're there to hunt a, a 200 pound fish, you know, you don't pull a trigger till you see a 200 pound fish. You know, that, that's the thing, you know, and now, now if it's, a, if it's the last day of your trip and you haven't shot one yet, well then, you know, go ahead and do whatever. But you know, those first couple of days, you gotta be patient and, and be willing to, to wait. I've been thinking a little bit lately about um, sort of the progression in blue water hunting, and I, I haven't done a lot of it, so I've been thinking a fair bit about it. And it seems like there's, you know, guys that are going out there to shoot the fish of a lifetime. Um, but, I mean, the first time you go out blue water hunting for dog tooth tuna, you probably, you know, you should uh, – do you think you, the big guys should curb their expectations and go out on a trip where it's like, okay, we're going to shoot maybe a, a 40 or a 60-pound dog tooth um, this time around, and that's kind of our goal for the trip, rather than going out and going, you know, I'm going to try and shoot a 120 or 140-pound one and get buried and lose all my gear and – you know what I mean? Like, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think, you know um, – the first time you go hunt doggies, okay, you're gonna get humbled. Okay, those those things are gonna you're you're not gonna believe what they do to you, you know. And you've heard a million doggy stories, and and if the fish doesn't do it to you, the sharks will, mm. you know. It's, it's it's one of the two. Um, but um, you know, the first dog I ever shot was probably like a like a 40, 50 pounder, mm. and I shot him with a rail gun, and I had my my gun clipped on the back of the the float line clipped on the back of the gun, you know, typical standard issue reef reef setup, mm. and that doggy took my my all my stuff down to the bottom at you know 140 feet down and wrapped around a rock. Oh, and and I'm at the surface and my floats down about 30 feet below me, and it's you know he's wrapped around a rock. And this is the first day of our trip, the first fish I shot, and my gun's down there and everything's down there, and I'm like, okay, well, and the current's running about you know three knots. <laughs> So, and me and my buddies are there and they go, Hey, okay, genius. What are you going to do now? I go, well, I'm going to swim down there. I'm going to cut my, Oh, I had cable shooting line too. So I'm going to go down there and I'm going to cut my cable shooting line. Let's go back to the boat. I need a pair of wire cutters. <laughs> wow. So, wow. Yeah. I mean, but those, those fish are crazy. You know, they, they're, that's, that's why to me it's the, and it's not just me, anybody that's, you know, you've been spearfishing for a long time and you get into, once you start hunting those things, it becomes a passion. It's like a, you know, and for you guys, it's, it's easier because you got them in the Coral Sea, you got them close by. And so I'd say for a first guy, back to the question, for a guy who's the first guy, first time going out there, um, you know, shoot a 30, 40 pounder, shoot a whatever, you know, whatever. But if you're going on a trip to where you, you know, like for me, when I've, I've decided that this is a place that's going to have the 200 pound doggy mm -hmm. and you put all your thoughts and all your energy and everything for two years, you've been planning this thing and you're convinced that's where they're going to be. When you go there, you don't want to F it up and, and you know, shoot a, a little one yeah, and scare yeah. off the big one. You know, it's like, a, you know, you, you don't go ugly early when you're, when you're, when you're getting <laughs> it's, You wait until it's 2 a.m., eh? He <laughs> yeah, went until 2 a.m., yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I love the analogy there. That is fantastic. Um, I guess maybe, you know, you should choose your dive buddies based on what your goals are. Um, if you're an experienced yeah. dog tooth hunter, then you go out with other experienced guys and you, and you have goals that are suitable for your level. If you're out there for a first time, maybe you've got to curb that and take people that are of a similar mind, uh, mindset and experience level. Yeah. And, you know, the, the same thing like for, you know, Wahoo. I mean, I've been on some of these Wahoo trips and, you know, the, the big school of them comes through and, and these guys are like taking wank shots at these fish from 20 feet away and missing them. And I'm like, what is wrong with you, man? I said, these fish are coming right to you. They're swimming towards you. Just wait till they get, wait till they get right there. Mm. And they, you can see his eyeballs and then shoot them. You know, don't, don't blow the whole school up. And, you know, and meanwhile in that school, there's 150 pounder, mm. you know, sitting there, that could be a new world record. And you just wanked on a 40 pounder and scared the whole school off, you know? So it's kind of a, 
I've heard I've heard they will hang around sometimes, so you, you, you can be a little bit selective if you've got a, a school, but I, I haven't encountered them yet, and um, it's coming up. It's coming up in my trip. Uh, it's, it's a goal of mine for sure. It's just um, like you say, you've got to have the money and the time and the planning to sort of back you up, and you've, but then you've got to also think about crew and location and all the rest of it as well. So, but um, Yeah, there's a lot of variables when you're doing that international travel, you know, and and the other thing is, you know, just packing your gear. I mean, having the right gear. And I have a, I actually have an Excel spreadsheet for my gear. And every trip out there, wherever I go, I, I have the, the basic spreadsheet that has everything on it. I'm talking like mask, snorkel, weight belt, gloves, booties, wetsuit, float line, you know, float or two floats or three floats mm-hmm. or, you know, bungee or whatever. And, you know, two knives and two, this and three of that and four of that and whatever. And the whole entire list that goes right down and there's, I, I can't remember how many things are on there, but it's like probably 60 items, you know, different things that you got to have. And then when you're traveling with a group of guys that you, you don't all have to have each one of you doesn't need a rigging kit. All you need is one rigging kit for the three. Of you. So you don't have to have triple kit of everything. And like for us, like a couple of my buddies, we all wear the same size fins. So we'll, we'll take like one extra set of fins for the group. Yeah. Nice. You know, if we all wear the same size foot and you know, like we bring two of us will bring an extra set of gloves, but we won't, but in case, you know, but the third guy doesn't need to bring an extra set of gloves and two of us will bring extra, extra dive socks when only, but you don't all need them, but just in case, cause you know, when you go halfway around, around the world and you're in some isolated place where there's nothing, you know, you don't want to be caught. You don't want to have your, your week long trip cut short because you, you know, don't have gloves or you don't have this or something or your mask broke or, or, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. So, you know, having, being prepared for those trips is, is, is key. And like when I go, I have a, I have, I use a, a, a snowboard bag, you know, like a ski bag to put all my guns and everything in. And I put it all in there and it weighs 70 pounds, like, you know, right on the button, you know, and, and that's, that's the maximum amount you can have with the, with the airlines. Mm. And it, it'll hold my, um, my, my, my one forty you know, gun with all, all the gear and everything. And all, or, oh, actually I can put like three guns in there, but in my buddies, we always use the same guns and they have rollers on them. So you roll them. They're easy to haul around. And then when you, the, the better, the benefit of that over a sport tube, you've heard of the sport tube. I, I use one. Yeah. So the benefit of the, the bag is that it has a zipper on top and you can take it in the boat with you and you can work out of it during the day. Yeah. When yeah. You're in a boat. You can, you know, so it's, it's a travel bag and a, in a day bag in the boat. So it works really good when you're, you know, in a panga, you know, some little crappy boat out in the middle of nowhere, you know, you can, you can have all your gear in that bag, hmm. um, which works out pretty good. La- and- Last trip I did multi-day trip was on a 60 foot boat. And, um, I had a sports tube and that sat on the deck for the whole three or four days we had out there and the bearings and the wheels, um, started to rust out of it. Yeah. And I felt, I felt pretty guilty cause it's actually a mate's one. And then, um, you know, thankfully the guys on the boat had tubs we could use for our gear, but I definitely hear the, the practicality of what you're talking about. Yeah, well, that, that thing on the wheels, that's that's big. You know, you, it's like I always – I lube my wheels up before I go on those trips. I actually spray stuff in there and, you know, silicone and mm. whatever because they will get salt and they will, you know, get bad. And nothing's worse than trying to drag that thing to the airport with stiff wheels, mm. you know. <laughs> it doesn't work. A lot of a lot of guys are, are trying to travel these days with um, very minimalist gear. And I see Rife, Rife – apparently Rife have brought out a travel spear gun that sort of clips into different parts. Um, and obviously rollers, you know, you can get a lot more um, range and power out of a, a, a smaller gun now. I mean, have you got a philosophy on that? Do you just prefer to take your go-tos? You know, I, I my philosophy is that, yes, rollers are smaller. Mm. You know, you, in other words, you know, a, a, one, a 120 roller is like the same as a 140 conventional, mm. you know, in my mind. Mm. And, you know, like some of those ones, like like the Abellin guns, you know, Abellins are, or um, not Abellin, um, Oh, what's who's the who's the roller gun guy? Um, well, there's many sub. Oh, you're talking about the the um the big ones, Armani, yeah. Armani, yeah, Armani, yeah. So you know he's making a travel gun now, you know, and he makes he makes the most ridiculous roller guns anywhere. Mm. His roller guns are crazy. Those things, and you know, traveling with him is tough. Okay, so a couple of years ago, some friends of mine were going to Costa Rica, mm. and they were going to go down there. And they get to the airport, and the airport says, "Hey, your bag can only be 120 centimeters." Oh. Well, they all had 140 centimeter guns. So they got kicked. They get, they, they kind of canceled their trip because they wouldn't let them on the plane yeah, yeah. with the gear. So stuff like that, you know, you have to rethink, you know, your travel 
Um, you have to rethink how you're going to get there. And it, it's either going to be with a roller gun, a shorter, a shorter gun like that, mm. or with a, some breakdown gun, you know, that, that breaks, you know, breaks down or you can go old school. Like I've done in the past. And that is, you just, you fed exit there before, before your trip. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've actually fed my gear to the, to the hotel before. Yeah. That'll work. Yeah. You know? That'll work. Yeah. It's expensive. Yeah, it it's is. not, it's not, but you know, they charge you $150 in the airport each way. Uh, to you know, bring your gun. So you know, it costs 180 to FedEx, and mm. so you know, you don't, you don't have to. Yeah, that's no, a good point. I, I like it. Um, what what's so you've got two trips that are tied up at the moment due to the COVID situation. Um, w- what are the what are the two trips? You want to share details? Yeah, sure. Um, one of them was to go to Belize, which is down in the Yucatan, like south of Mexico, and. Um, they have a, you know, they have a, they have a great fishery down there. It's really, it's really cool. It's, it's, um, there's nothing, there's no, there's not like any world records down there, but it's, but it's really a great place to go. The water's really crystal clear. Um, they had great reef fish. They got Wahoo. Um, they got, you know, some different things there and at certain times of the year, it's really, really good. So, you know, they have some spawns down there that are really good. Then, um, it's a remote, this, this place that I, I want to go is a very remote place out in the remote area. Um, it's pretty cool. So that, that's a, a great place to go. Um, the other one is, 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 is um, uh, Eastern Africa, you know, over there. So somewhere between Mozambique and Somalia. Um, <laughs> Sounds like Tanzania to me. <laughs> <laughs> somewhere in that, that general vicinity, yeah. <laughs> I'm just having a look here. Um, see if you can oh, – I haven't tried this before, so just bear with me, um, GR. I'm just pulling up a, a map here. Can you see it? Yeah. Um, so you said down Belize. Where whereabouts am I looking here? In the, just um, the area. You don't have to be specific with it. You said you. Yeah, you're, you're really close. See Belize City right there. Yeah. Right up there. Oh, okay. See the turn off atoll. Yep. See the turn off atoll. Yep. See that other, see that other spot farther out. Yep, yep. There you go. Lighthouse Wow, reef. that looks cool, man. What an amazing part of the world. Like just zooming out here, it's um, there's some fantastic looking um sort of structure and stuff around here it'd be oh it's a it's a part of the world i'd like to travel to actually so um hmm, who knows in the future <laughs> there, there's a, there's a lot of great stuff like that, that that map you have right there is like all the great stuff in this hemisphere you know for us over here on this side that's there's some really great stuff there yeah cool, it's fun cool yeah, I'm always curious, and um, I mean, when you travel, start traveling around and having a look at places, you you become quite well aware of the, you know, the all of the different cities and the logistics between getting places and stuff, and um, I, that's pretty handy from Florida, isn't it? I'm um, fairly, yeah, you know, compared to going to Polynesia or compared to going to Australia. I mean, God, you know, my my last trip home from Australia it took me I don't know how many hours. It took me thirty hours or something like that to get home. <laughs> you know, I think I had two different hangovers from that trip. Yeah, yeah. On the way home. Oh wow. Yeah, so, um, but yeah, there, those these places here, like you know, they're like four or five hours away. So it's, it's pretty reasonable. You know? That's a good way to um, plan trips. I think that's a two hangover flight. <laughs> yeah, two hangover flight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, the guys when they when they go to like Ascension Island, it could be like a three three hangover flight, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've heard, but it seems to have shut down now. I don't. There's a like I think the, yeah, the military installation's been removed or something. Something crazy going on. Yeah, the run, the runway's not working. They don't have the flights there. It's it's gotten kind of, you know, it's 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 getting way off the it's it's off the grid right now. Mm. You know, so. Mm. Um, Cool. Hey, I, w- yeah. I wanted to ask you, um, just get back into my main interview flow for a sec. Um, what's one of the scariest sort of situations you've had out um, spearfishing and, and uh, what did you sort of take away from it? I kind of gave you two of them earlier. The one was like, you know, doing that that tournament down there with a 16-foot swell. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. That was, that was pretty scary. Mm. Um, the other one. And 45 minutes um, to calm down. Like um, I can relate to that yeah. after a big swim. Yeah, I mean, that's 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 pretty 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 tough, you yeah. know. Um, I've never had anybody in my trips ever black out, you know, so I haven't had to deal with that. Um, you know, that would be really scary if you're, uh, you know, on a group, I've never had anybody in my trips ever get bitten by a shark. Hmm. I take that back. I did have one buddy get bit by a shark, but it was a, it was a three foot long shark and it, and it, and it bit him on the shoulder. So it didn't really matter. You know, it wasn't like a life or death situation. Um, and your, but you know, so I, in your mind, in your mind, what are the biggest risks? Like you encounter regularly with spearfishing, so you, you I mean you mentioned shallow water blackout and sharks. Are they are they the two biggest in your mind? Yeah, those are like the two biggest risks I think you run into out there. I mean mm. that's that's it. And 
you know, sharks have gotten a lot worse in the last few years because they don't, they don't hunt them anymore. You know, like they, it's against the law to commercially fish them. So, you know, there's, there's more of them and, and, you know, as more people spearfish, I don't say more, but you know, as people spearfish, you know, sharks learn the, the sound of that trigger mm. and they hear that trigger go off and they hear a fish, you know, they'll come from a mile away to, to see what's for dinner, mm-hmm. you know, and you know, and it can get, you know, get pretty dodgy, mm. you know, sometimes when you're doing that. This episode of the Noob Sparrow Podcast is brought to you by the world's greatest spearfishing magazine, Spearing Magazine. There are news and reviews for the latest spearfishing equipment and gadgets inside. There's practical how-to and DIY type articles. There's spearing adventures from crazy noobers like you from all over the world. And uh, it's, it's a magazine that you can pick up or you can look at. And if you've got the digital subscription, you can flick through and let it inspire your next spearfishing adventure, even if you're having a dry run. Keep the stoke alive. Check it out at spearingmagazine.com. If you're away from the good old USA, though, check out the international subscription. That's at spearingmagazine.com. Is that more spearfishing shit? Yeah, it is, honey, but it's my favourite podcast. You just can't stop yourself. You're obsessed. Well, that's true, but Shrek told me I'd, I'd lose my 90s dad look. Baby, it's all for you. For those that are a little obsessed, head over to noobspirit.com forward slash madgear. Got hats, beanies, tank tops, t-shirts and hoodies for noobers who are mad about spearing. Noobspirit.com forward slash madgear. All right, hey, um... Well, I wanted to wrap out sort of spearfishing and traveling and maybe chat about uh, get back into some dive gear again. Um, earlier you mentioned um, you, you started geeking out on spear, spear, spear gun shafts. Um, mm-hmm. What made you do that? Was there something about spear, spear gun shafts that you didn't like that, you know, that were on the market? What was different about what you did? Well, when I started making those, you know, those like more custom type guns and making better guns and what have you, you know, you couldn't find a shaft that would go in it. You know, where would you get a shaft to fit one of those guns? There, there was no place, you know, like, so you had to make your own shaft. And, and then I started, you know, having friends say, Hey, can you make me one of these shafts? I need one of these shafts, I need the shaft. And I said, well, all right. So then I started making these shafts and, you know, doing my, my I, I found a way I can mass produce them and, you know, by mass producing, we get the price down mm. and, you know, you make them, you know, so they're not, there's guys out there that are selling some of these shafts for two hundred dollars a shaft, you know, and you know I can sell those same those same shafts today for seventy dollars. Yeah, you know, so it's a big, you know, big difference when you can mass produce them. And there's there's a market for it. You know, are we talking spring steel, stainless? Um, what materials did you? Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's you know seven fourteen you know stainless steel. You know, it's a spring alloy steel. Um, they're not like the Rob Allen shafts, which are just a spring steel that's coated. You know. It's a different, different style of shaft. Okay, and f- finned or notched, um, and what's? Yeah, I, I do. I make all the the fin, the fin shafts. Yeah, mini fins for the Euro guns and regular American shafts for the enclosed track or American fins for the American enclosed track guns. Okay, cool. And um, I mean, day to day, what's what's your dive gear look like? Um, I'd love to have a walkthrough of your Floridian sort of dive bag. Yeah, for me, I mean, I'm fair, I'm fair skinned and fair eyed, you know, so I have to always uh, stay covered up. So I wear, um, you know, when it's cold, I wear a five mil suit and five mil gloves and five mil booties and, you know, I'm completely covered. Um, then I wear, then then the season changes, I wear a three mil all the way. Then I wear a one mil all the way. And then I wear a skin, like I wear like a, you know, under armor shirt with a, with a lycra hood and, you know, uh, like uh, yoga pants, you know, to, for better, better, better leg of a thing, but just to stay completely covered out of the sun, you know, I try to stay out of the sun as much as possible. That's my main, from that, I mean, from that, your fins and your gloves and everything else go around it. But that's the first thing I do is, you know, like, what am I going to wear that day for the, the type of, you know, water conditions that I'm going to be diving in? Okay. Fins, um, fins. Are you diving carbon fiber fins? Um, I am now, um, for forever. I didn't. Um, the first, the first pair of carbon fiber fins I got and the same ones I have now are the no, dive R's, um, you know, and you know, I love those, I love those fins. They're great. Um, the, uh, I actually won a pair of them in a tournament at the blue water world cup years ago and they were all laughing at me because I was diving steel Cressy, you know, HF two thousands <laughs> and I won the tournament with those on, you know, and I didn't know any better. I mean, I was diving 120 feet with those things on mm-hmm. and, and, you know, never knew 
I didn't know any better. I didn't know what carbon fins were. I didn't know. I heard about them, but I never seen them, mm. you know, and nobody I knew had them. And then a couple of friends got different carbon fins. They break every trip we go out. They, the, the foot pockets would break. The thing would snap or whatever. And I go, yeah, those things are really good. Meanwhile, I'm cutting burly on top of my other, my plastic fins, <laughs> you know, I don't, you know I don't even care. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, don't ever let fins determine, you know, how well you dive or how many fish you can get. Cause I did it forever, you know, without, without those and they were fine. And, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to spend $400 on a pair of fins. You can get a pair of fins for a hundred dollars and be happy. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think plastics are a great place to start. And, uh, and, and, and that, yeah, that, for sure. that, that nearly as, as efficient and they're far more robust than anything. Um, with carbon fiber, there's definitely some carbon fiber fins that are made for like free diving performance and they're not really that good for spearfishing with, you know, it, you, that, that's what you just, that's the point you just made, which is perfect, which is a lot of gear is, you know, free diving gear. Mm. Well, free diving gear is not what we want to dive with. Mm. We want spearfishing gear. Mm. You know, we want stuff that's, that's specific to what we do in like wetsuits. I get people, they go out and they get these smooth skin wetsuits on the outside. Mm. I go, what are you doing with that thing? <laughs> you know, and their, wetsuit, their, their wetsuits never make a half a season. You know, the rocks chew them up, the boat chews them up, everything chews them up and they're gone, you know. And we try and justify telling me why they have this thing. And I go, well, you know, why don't you get a spearfishing wetsuit? You know, they'll last you know, three seasons of heavy diving, you know? Yeah. That's, just, that, that's know, kind but, of a minimum. That, that's a good life expectancy. I think out of a suit, you know, and then if it's a five mil after three seasons, hopefully it's now your three mil suit because it's compressed a little yeah, bit. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But, Another aqua you can't fix, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, those divers and um, I mean, Penetrator sponsor the new spirit podcast, they're quite similar, um, you know, like that they're intended for a spearfishing purpose so even the carbon fibers are far more um robust than other carbon fiber um sort of fins that are on the market and uh, they're both sort of australia made products too so that's that's fantastic yeah. that we've made yeah. a an impact over in your part of the world yeah i mean they have and you know ray ray makes i mean his fins are awesome mm-hmm. i mean i've got i have a pair of his fins that I, the first pair i got they're 10 years old and they're still going mm-hmm. you know and they, they're a little chipped up at the front and stuff and whatever. And that's why I bought a new pair just because, you know, they were getting kind of old and I didn't want them to, I didn't want to go on a trip and have them break on a trip, you know, but I've stopped to use them. And I, I said, these things are still going, you know, they're, they're fantastic. What, um, so when you did finally make the switch from plastic to carbon fiber, I mean, did, what impact did it make on your diving? How, how, how big was the impact and, and you know, yeah, what, what's changed? It really hasn't made an impact in my diving or my spearfishing. I mean, I'm pretty much the same diver I was before. But I, I, the one thing it, you, you, you talk about the subtle differences earlier mm. between this gear and that gear and what have you. But so I tell anybody out there, if they don't believe in carbon fiber fins, do this, go put a pair of carbon fiber fins on, go dive with them for like an hour, then get your old plastic fins and put them back on and start diving <laughs> and watch what happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It is like, it is like somebody tied a pair of bricks on both your ankles and said, okay, now go swim. Yeah. You know, yeah. it, it, you never notice it until you've gone backwards. Yes. Yeah, you know, if you put the carbon fibers on and go with them and then went back to the old, the old school fins, you, that's when you really, really notice it. So there is a difference there and you may not notice it switching from plastic to carbon fiber, but if you had to go back to plastics, you're, you'll feel like, how did I ever dive in those things? Mm-hmm. You know? One thing I've been curious about is why um, some of the red tide equipment hasn't made its way south. Um, have you got distributors in uh, this part in the southern hemisphere? I do not, and you know, not for any big reason other than like I, 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 sell, I sell gear over there. Guys buy gear from me mm. over there, mm. um, but just the individuals. But the problem is, you know, shipping over there. Unless I had a distributor that was willing to buy, you know, X amount of dollars worth of stuff and you know, ship it in a container and do it, you know, economically. Yeah. It really doesn't make sense. And that's what a lot of the U.S. distributors have problems with, you know, to sell stuff over there is it's tough on the shipping side. And, you know, there's um, – and I have, a lot of, I have a lot of stuff that would be great over yeah, there. Yeah, for sure. You know, you know, my knives, my float lines, my reels. You know, my reels, you're going to laugh. I, I sell more of my red tide reels on Rob Allen guns here in the States than Rob Allen sells red tide reels. Wow. Then, then, uh, then Rob Allen sells Rob Allen Rob Allen reels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like I'm a, and so what I did is I took the Rob Allen reel, mm. okay, and said what was wrong with that reel, you know? So what's wrong with it? it has the the base where it slides onto the dovetail on the the gun, and they always crack, they crack right there. Yeah, yep, yep. So I put a metal base on mine so they don't crack. 
the his little knob on the top of his drag is a little BS knob, yeah. you know, I put a more robust knob on there and, you know, so, you know, I, I made it, I, I took the, something that was currently good, but made it way better. <laughs> you know? and, I think that's, and then I, took, I think that's smart. And then, you know, so then what else I did instead of just having one size reel, now I have four size reels. It's the same reel, but four different sizes. I have a 30 meter, a 50 meter, an 80 meter and a hundred meter, you know? So, you know, you can, Depending on what kind of gun you want, what kind of fish you're shooting, you you have you have a different reel for each size. You know, mm. I um I got sold the sort of the the thing with the reel, like oh you want a nice little tight compact one, so it, you know it doesn't affect your hydrodynamics and blah 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 blah. And um, I, I think it's well, like I, I don't really agree with it because if I'm diving in seventy feet of water, then I'm going to want far more than that in line on my reel because. If it holds up and there's a little bit of current, then I want to be able to get back to the surface. Number one, um, and 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 um, and it just seems you just seem to have more ability to play some of the larger fighting fish if you shoot them on the surface and they run along the surface. But but I mean, I'd love to hear your sort of idea on the use cases for these different um, style reels. Yeah. So uh, two things. Um, one is one of the things I liked about the Rob Allen reel when the first time I saw one was the weight of it. It weighs nothing. It's very, very lightweight. Yeah, for sure. And for me, that fits into my whole thing about, about real or about, about guns is to have a balanced gun. And some of these guns, some of these reels are heavy mm. and you put a heavy reel on a nice balanced gun, or sometimes you put a heavy reel on a gun and you can't even balance it because it's negative, makes the whole gun negative and you can't, it's hard to add flotation to a gun. It's easy to add weight to a gun to make it neutral, but it's hard to add flotation to a gun to make it buoyant, mm. you know? So, um, that's a big thing. And so I wanted to make a lightweight reel that, you know, wouldn't affect the, the buoyancy of your gun okay. or, or it did it very, very minimally. And, you know, two ounces of weight is take, take your gun and put, add, take a two ounce weight and put it on the front of it and see what happens. You know, it, it changes everything. So, you know, you want to be able to have a reel that you know, doesn't change everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the different sizes um, or for different sizes, different types of fish. So, you know, shooting dirty water, shallow water, whatever, the 30 meter reel is perfect. You know, that's all you need. You can shoot anything with that and, um, never really worry about it on the reef, you know, like typical stuff that I've dove on when I was in Australia, I'd say a 50 meter reel, mm. you know, would be good. Mm. You can shoot pretty much anything. You can shoot the, the, the Spanish mackerel with that. You can shoot, you know, pretty much anything, you know, that you're going to come up, come across. Um, now, if you're diving at a place that has Wahoo and, you, you know, you're not targeting Wahoo, but you're diving at like a reef and, you, you know, Wahoo are known to come through there or something like that, you're going to want a bigger reel mm. just in case because, you know, Wahoo will smoke a, a 50 meter reel, you know, they, they'll just, they'll just you know, smoke it. And you'll, you'll be hanging on. And the next thing you know, you won't be hanging on anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, so, um, that's for that. And then the, our big reel, the hundred meter reel, that's, that's for a guy that's, you know, diving the deep edge. And, you know, a tuna could come by or whatever could come by. And that's your only, sh- you're not targeting them because you're going to be targeting those kind of fish. You want to use a float line. Yeah, yeah. But you could be out there, you know, diving, shooting groupers and shooting snappers and shooting different things along that, that reef edge. But next thing you know, you look up and there's this big tuna, you know, what are you going to do? Not, not shoot them. Yep, yep. You know, so, so there's, there's a chance that you could land them with that, you know. And I'm, I'm funny with the reel too. Me, I will, when my, if my if fish spools my reel, I get to the very end of my reel, I let go of my gun. I just like, I mean, hold on. I let them just take off with it okay. because generally speaking, they're going to only go like, they usually do like a big circle. That's what they usually do. Most fish will take off and do a big giant circle. And I just start swimming as fast as I can after it, you know, and you, next thing you know, you're, you're back in contact with the reel again. The fish has slowed down and now you, know, now you just start pulling them in, you know, like, like regular. So do you ever use a belt reel? You know, I, I make belt reels. And so I, I, the funny thing is here's a guy who makes them and designed them and did all this stuff and you know i don't even use them mm-hmm. and i'm not saying that i wouldn't use one i just you know never really it never fit my style but i started making them because you know the market wants them um a lot of guys here in, in the bahamas and stuff they use them on pole spears you know like so it works great on a pole spear and i just recently started making pole spears so that's why i started making the belt reels so i figured the pole spear guys would want to you know use my belt reels on them but i know in australia you guys i think you guys have been in them over there right is that where it started? I think it might have been Aussie Reels. I'm not sure. It could have been Barry Paxman. I, I don't know too much about the history of the the Reels. Yeah, I don't know where they started. They either started there or in South Africa, one of the two places they started. And it's, it's like a, 
you know, like stringers on like the, the Kui stringers, you know, like I call them the, the, like, you know, the Australians have been using those, those speed, the speed stringers, speed line stringers, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, for, they're fantastic. I mean, we didn't ever have those over here. Um, we used to use like an old clip, a clip type stringer, you know, and then I saw those things when I, and I said, those are great. Yeah, yeah. You just slide your fish right on them and slide them down the thing. Well, now there's some sharks over here. You don't dare do that because you know, all you're doing, you put all the fish on the end of your float line. And next thing you know, you, you're getting drugged backwards mm. through the water and two sharks mm. are fighting on your thing. They bite your float line in half, you know? So one of those, if you're going to do it, I think you've got to do it on um, some line that will easily break. If you have it on like, um, you know, steel line or even like, 400 pound mono or something like the shark's just going to drag you if it's on a float line and you, you know like you get yourself in trouble oh, we, we run like off where i'm diving here a lot of the time we'll just run a boaty and you shoot a fish it goes on the boat yeah mm. that's how we do we just we just throw the fish back in the boat anymore in the old days we used to just string them you know we, we'd drag them around with us all over out there never to worry about it it's a funny story i had a one time i did have a shark grab my 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 fish that was on a springer on the end of my float line and the gun got yanked out of my hands and the gun's hauling ass is flying across the water and I'm swimming as fast as I can after because I figured out what had happened. And as I'm getting closer to the gun, the, the spear is aiming right at my mask, like right at my face. And I'm swimming as far as I can trying to grab a hold of it. I'm going, this is a really bad idea, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. These are the situations that happen too. I've heard the same story, and I think that horrified me. Um, um, yeah, but yeah, it is interesting. There's a demand. Uh, the belt reel thing. It does seem that Spiro's are split on whether or not to keep it or not. And um, I have a, a, a guy that I chat with all the time, and his motto is, you know, if you're going to use a real gun at all, then you've always got to be prepared to lose your spear gun and let the thing go. And um, yeah, if you can't afford to let that spear gun go, then just dive with the float line. Yeah, um, no, I, I'd agree. I mean, yeah, the, and that's one of the things I, I years ago I did a talk for some young guys at a, at a high school, and I said, man, just learn to let go. You know, just let go. If if, if your real if your real jams up or the, the the line gets caught in the bands or something like that, just immediately let go. Don't try and manhandle it. Don't try and figure it out because you know by the time you figure it out, manhandle it, you're gonna be down. You're gonna be drugged down so deep you're never gonna get back up. You know. And, yeah, for sure. And uh, yeah, that, that struggle is what can. You know, I've had a couple of friends die over the years and, and we don't know exactly how it happened, but we can assume how it happened. You know, we found one guy's reel and it was jammed up Found another guy's thing with the float line was uh, the, the shooting line was called in the bands. And, you know, that just kind of tells you that he was struggling from something yeah. and you know, something bad happened. So, yeah, just just let go. Man. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gun. You can replace the gun, you know. Yeah, no, cool. Hey, I'm just conscious of your time, Gia. I've had a mad time chatting today, but I really want to get through um, these uh, Spiro Q&A, which is sort of a faster-paced round of um, questions on the way out. How does that sound? Yeah, whatever. We're good. All right, cool. Um, What's the single best piece of advice you've ever been given for spearing? That I've ever been given to me, and it would probably probably be to slow down, you know. Um, The guys back in the day, you know, we would dive with tanks on and go spearfishing, and They'd say, hey, when you get down to the bottom, just sit there. Don't don't go chasing up and down the reef, you know, chasing the fish. Just sit in one spot, let the fish come to you, and shoot them. Mm-hmm. And I've taken that same thing and applied it to free diving. You know, you, you drop down and sit on the sand and stare at the bomb, you know, stare at the rock. And the fish will come out to see what you are and you shoot them, you know. You don't have to, you know, chase them up and down the reef. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Um, who has been the most influential person or people in your spearfishing? Well, you know, my parents were the first that – you know, take me spearfishing. So that was pretty influential. They didn't, they were just, you know, they, they get a fish, they just go out and shoot one fish for dinner. You know, that was kind of like their, their thing. Um, then I turned into a little savage. And you don't want to go out and kill everything. <laughs> um, uh, the red, but, uh, red tide uh, savage. The, the red tide savage. Yeah. Um, but that's um, what I'm yeah, calling this, this interview. I think <laughs> the, red, the, red, the red tide savage. Yeah. It's a great name. Yeah. Um, but I had, you know, this friend of mine, Skip Ward, and he's about 10 years older, like maybe, maybe 13 years older than I am. And, you know, he was a guy that I grew up, you know, spearfishing with. And, you know, we used to, you know, dive a lot together and we learned a lot together. And, and this is before, you know, magazines, before the internet, before stuff, you know, we just kind of learned off each other. And, and so he was kind of like a mentor cause he's like my big brother and, you know, very, very influential and, you know, a lot of a lot of great times and big fish and you know fun stories. 
Mm, cool, cool. All right, hey, last one. Um, can you describe what the spearfishing experience means to you in one sentence? You know, for me, it's just about the excitement. You know, the, the one sentence would be, you know, spearfishing kind of takes hunting and takes fishing and puts them both together in your spearfishing. Mm. And to me, it, it's just like the, the perfect, you know. Marriage. It's perfect, perfect, yeah, mm. perfect marriage. Mm. It's like the Reese's peanut butter cup, you know. <laughs> no. Half chocolate, half peanut butter. Oh, that's, it doesn't get any better. We don't than, get that no. here. I want that now. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> that sounds like a new sponsor for the show based on my diet. <laughs> hey, um, I was going to ask you too, where can people come and find you? I mean, obviously there's redtidespearfishing.com. Um, you're on Instagram. What are you on Instagram as? Yeah, Red Tide Spearfishing. Cool. You got it all going on? Have you got a YouTube channel? Uh, I do, but it's not too big. There's some stuff on there. You know, it's not really, really big. It's, that's one of those things. If I had more time, it'd be bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I am probably, I, I probably spent more money and more time making crappy videos than anybody in the world. <laughs> There's no crappy man. You're your own worst critic. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, yeah, it's, um, but YouTube is like, you know, that there's some great stuff on YouTube. In fact, you know what? I would say that for like the new guys, you know, go on YouTube and watch YouTube spearfishing videos. There's so much great stuff on there to learn. And you can actually see how fish react and see how divers shoot and see stuff. And you'll see some guys are complete wankers and they just do everything wrong, you know. And, and like for me, it's really hard to watch. Like I, have to, I have to change channels or speed up or do something because it drives me crazy. But then you'll see some guys that really, really do a good job and they're, they're really on point. And, and, you know, but the biggest thing, you know, to me is the guys that are having the most fun. Mm. You know, they're having a lot of fun and they're, that's, that's, that's where I want to be. Man, yeah. I'm on the same page as you. I think one of the, your quote um, came on the show years ago. Actually, you've influenced this podcast in so many ways, but I think it was um, the dude having the most um, fun is the one that, that's winning at spearfishing. Yeah, the, the, it's the, the, best, the best spear fisherman in the world is the one having the most yeah, fun. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And um, we didn't even get to your burly bomb uh, recipe that um, Jeremy Gamble told me about. Um, but I, I think we're gonna, I'm going to have to have another chat with you in the future, GR. Oh, anytime, anytime. I'm, I'm down for it. Cool, man. Well, I'm going to link up, um, you know, Red Tide and all of your socials in today's show notes. So if people go to noobspero.com forward slash GR, uh, everything will be there. And um, I'm definitely titling this episode, The Red Tide Savage. <laughs> 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 so thanks for joining me today, man. All right, man. Thank you so much. You take care. The Red Tide Savage, GR Tar. What an absolute character. I, love, I really enjoyed that chat today. So uh, cool dude. And I uh, hope to catch up with him again in the future. Maybe next year if I do get over on this patron-funded trip to the US. Because um, Noob Spiro's got a patron. So if you head over to patreon.com forward slash Noob Spiro, you can become a listener supporter. There's 31 legends supporting the show at the moment. Every single dollar raised goes towards funding spearfishing trips where I get to come out and dive with listeners, do live interviews, and just check out your part of the world. So patreon.com forward slash new spear if you do froth on the show and you're a regular listener and you get a ton of value out of it, I'd encourage you to come over and, and, uh, and do that. But hey, um, we are off in another week to chat smoking fish. That's my phone awkwardly going off, so I'm going to have to take that. But hey, Michael Wispy from Matakana Smokehouse in New Zealand. We get dirty on how to smoke fish. I'll see you then. Catch ya. An upgrade to composite or carbon fibre fins often marks the stage of the next step of your spearfishing evolution. Composite or carbon fibre confer a huge advantage in terms of performance for the Spiro. Not only will you get better performance in the water, but you will suffer from less fatigue as well. And I'm going to recommend the fins that I wear myself, Penetrator Fins. You can check them out at penetratorfins.com. They've got the best warranty in the industry, and you can get a discount today by using the code NoobSpiro and save $25 on any set of Penetrator Fins. Penetratorfins.com, proud sponsors of the Noob Spiro podcast. Four strong reasons to shop at spearfishing.com.au. They have a price beat guarantee on any Australian price for spearfishing equipment if they stock it. $15 flat rate shipping across Australia. They've got a 30 day hassles free returns policy and you can save 20 bucks on every purchase over 200 by using the code NoobSpiro at checkout when you shop online. Added to that, 
if you order gear online, it arrives quickly. It's very well packaged. It's a literal no-brainer if you're a spearer in Australia. Shop spearfishing.com.au. Use the code NoSpearOnSave. <laughs>